Welcome back everybody, this is Brother Mute here. Today we're doing a, a video, or I'm not sure, probably it'll be a couple of series of videos here, uh, where we're going to talk about feats. And I want to kind of drive you away from ones that are god-awful, horrible feats that you guys may be like, ooh, that sounds interesting, and yeah, it turns out it's probably never going to be used, or there's a better option is another example. Uh, so how are we going to break this down? So if I'm going to do this in multiple videos, probably at least two, uh, I'm going to have one that's going to be wizard, or excuse me, magic feats or, or spell casting type feats, which is what we're going to do right now. Uh, depending on how long that takes to go through, I may dip into, say, teamwork feats, which is a subcategory that can be spell caster related, could also be you know, fighting or combat feat related, which will be another video because that one's very huge. And then, of course, we'll have a video that will cover just generic feats. Those will usually include things like skill focus uh, feats, you know, ones that like, oh, give me a skill focus to athletics check, where I get a bonus to my athletics check plus three. If I get enough skill points ranked into that particular skill, again, athletics, then instead of it being a plus three, it becomes a plus six. So we'll talk about stuff like that in these various videos. So hopefully this will kind of drive you into to what kind of feats you might want to take. Now, this is not... Uh, an official list by any stretch of the imagination and the game still in beta stuff could change but uh based on the description of the feats is going to be my impersonation or impression excuse me of what i think uh, of the feat and how you might use it or not uh, pick it all together uh notice uh, i'm going to play uh, uh as a wizard right now just so i can uh easily show you the the list of spell feats uh, it doesn't matter what race I am or anything like that. I'm just going to pick stuff and move. Uh, let's get to it. Uh, here's plenty smart, and who cares about anything else? Sounds good. Uh, again, we'll talk about skill points as they pertain to skill feats later. Uh, of course, we'll talk briefly about any prerequisites. Notice that I have a mod that allows me to have access to everything. So you see that this is literally every, every feat, I believe, in the game. Notice it's already given me thumbs up and thumbs down category. And again, I'm not going to go through all of these right now because, again, it would just take forever, this one video. Not that that's ever been a problem for me, but I'm trying to keep these things brief as I can. So, digestible bites, if you will. So, we're going to grab something here that has absolutely nothing to do with our very important wizard bonus feat. Again, those are the ones that I call, quote-unquote, spell feats. And again, that, like I said, that's not every spell feat that I think of. When I get to other ones that I'm like, this feels more like something that a spell caster would use, then I'll again re-emphasize the point that it probably belongs in this category, even though the wizard bonus feat doesn't apply there. So let's just grab, um, since I'm a deck space character, let's just get something that is a staple. Uh, we'll grab something called Weapon Finesse. Notice how it's even giving me a thumbs down, even though that's a terrible recommendation here. You are a deck space character. I have a dex of 15, strength of 11. If I want to hit anything... Uh, unless it's a ranged attack, which again, wizards are good at, um, especially with a dex of 15 or higher. You know, you want to hit something in melee, weapon finesse is going to be your thing. So again, this is a solid combat feat. Again, we'll talk about that when we do the combats. But this is the one I want to get you to here for the, the bonus wizard feat. Now notice this list. I'll make sure I have my list in front of me here. So I have things like combat casting. I went in alphabetical order. Combat casting, of course, augmented summonings in here somewhere. There you go. I uh, also have uh, greater elemental focus and elemental focus here and here. Greater spell focus, of course, as well as spell foci, which are somewhere else, right here. Um, we also have all the meta magics that are in the game currently. Uh, and this is a very nice list because selective spell wasn't in the list before. Same with persistent. They were not in Kingmaker, if I remember correctly. So all these other ones were there. So they've added to this. And it's sad that they didn't add some of my favorites uh, that were um, added by mods in Kingmaker. One of which was called Metamagic Intensified Spell. And that thing is amazing. This is the one that people swear by for um, Magi. Uh, builds for Magus class because they can literally take a spell that's like level one spell that does upwards of five d six of damage, but that's where it caps out. And the meta magic intensified increases the caster level of the spell. So instead of it being a level one spell slot, it's now level two, let's say, but allows you to increase the cap by five more levels. What does that mean? Well, if it's one d six per level and it caps out at, at the fifth level, that's five d six of damage, like Shocking Grass is a staple for a Magus. Uh, corrosive Touch being another example, instead of doing 5d6, though it does 5d4 of acid damage. And again, only at level 5 on up. 
if you intensified those spells, that would literally allow you to bring it, if you have the caster level, of course, beyond 5d6 or 5d4, upwards of uh, 10d6 or 10d4. It doesn't work for every spell this way. Uh, for example, another one that's a level 1 spell called Ear Piercing Scream does 1d6 of damage, caps out at 5d6 of damage, and you may say, well, then why doesn't it go to 10? The reasoning behind that one is, is it literally takes uh, 1d6 per two caster levels. And remember what intensified metamagic does. It increases it by five levels, or it raises the cap, I should say, by five levels. So if you're caster level 10, you're still getting the 5d6. If you're caster level 15, which is where it would break, then it's 15 divided by two rounded down. So it'd be a 7d6 of damage. It's still better damage. It's just not as much as you were hoping for. So again, you'll see examples of this if you were to play it with Mott. But let's talk about the game that we actually have. Uh, notice we have Spell Pen and Greater Spell Pen as well. Spell Specialization and, of course, Superior Summoning. So let's go through the list in alphabetical order, shall we? Augmented Summoning. Uh, I'm going to grade these in a tier of, of, of three different categories. I'll have a star next to it on my piece of paper, which means I consider it good or a, at least a useful feat pick. Uh, I'll have a, or a question mark next to it because then it's more situational. Where I mean, and again, this would be one that you would say, well, it's situational, only it works on summons. Yes, but it's an amazing upgrade. So this one would be one that falls under the useful or good category. So I give this one a star. Then, of course, there's the dash, which is just straight up, this is a lame pick. Don't waste your time on it. And there's a rare, and there's almost always an exception to the rule. So again, this is just my personal take on these things, but... There are exceptions to the rule where you can say, well, I can use it in this build where I suddenly am tripping monster bastard man because I grabbed all these feats. Yeah, but look how many feats you had to grab just to become good at that one thing, right? So again, situational, yeah, useless, again, lame, yeah, it falls under those categories. So usually when I, I hem and haw over this stuff, it's because I would give it a question mark just because I know there's ways to make it good or, you know, again, situational where it's at least useful. Uh, but... Nine times out of ten, you're not building in that way. Okay, so this one here would get a star. Why? Because again, you're getting any of your conjuration spells. And let's be real clear: this, we're talking about not the uh, undead, not the animate dead spell, or the create undead. Any summon, something that falls into the conjuration school, where it's a pet of some kind. Now, this can be a, a summon monster, one through nine. This could be a summon elemental. You know, we're talking about the, the small, medium, large, huge you know, things of this nature. Uh, could be if you were a, a druid or a ranger where you had the summoning ability for um, summon nature's ally. Again, that's a summoning spell. They would get a permanent, any of your summons, a permanent plus four bonus to their strength and their con for the duration of the spell. This is a solid bonus to their damage and probably a bonus to their swing because very few are probably weapon finessing, but it's probably there. Uh, definitely better con, so therefore better HP, better fortitude saves. You can see the appeal. Uh, mirrored with this one, um, just to skip around a little bit, we're talking about superior summoning. This one, actually, uh, I, I give a star to it normally, uh, simply because if I'm going to go that route, I'm, I'm definitely going this route as well. But I would probably say, uh, in all honesty, this one would probably be a question mark. Why? Because it doesn't work on every summons. Why? You just said that it works on summons. Yes, but this one only works on summons if you're already summoning, or could, let's be clear on this, could summon more than one monster. Give you an example. Summon monster one. This will not work on it. Why? Because you only summon a dog. One dog. Forever. That's all you're ever going to get out of that one spell is one dog. Yes, augmented summoning. This one up here will benefit it. Because again, that one dog is a summons. He'll get a bonus to his strength. He'll get a bonus to his con. But as far as superior summoning, you will not get two. But there's an example of a next spell on the list. Summon monster two gives you a choice. You can either get one, I want to say it's a wolf or a lizard, or something like that. Uh, I think it's a wolf, though. Or, you could get one to three dogs. And again, that's a die roll, so it says 1d3. So they roll a three-sided die, which of course doesn't exist. Just work with me on this. Literally, you get a choice of you get one dog, two dogs, or three dogs. It's random as hell. But, because of that randomness, with superior summoning, that 1d3 actually turns into 1d3 plus one. And I can prove it to you if we ever actually play the game, Trust me on this. I've tested it myself. This does work. Why does it work? So again, if you roll a 1d3, you want to prove it to yourself, the choices would be you could get one dog, two dogs, or three dogs. Well, if I get a plus one 
to it, which is what superior summoning does. So it's be 1d3 plus 1. My range then now becomes 2, 3, or 4. Now how do you prove that? We other than rolling it multiple times and resummoning the, the dogs multiple times and never getting just one dog. Well, that's one thing. So if you get four, what did you roll? You had three. If you get two dogs, what did you roll? Did you roll a two? No, because if you had two dogs, it should be three because superior summoning would kick in. So that's where you get the three dogs. So how do you ever get just two? It's when you roll one dog and you get the freeze pet from superior summoning. That's how you get two. So if you ever see that you get two of those guys, you know superior summoning is working. On that same spell, you have to choose. Are you going to summon one wolf? And again, it will be only one. Or do you want two to four dogs? Because superior summoning kicks in, so it's 1d3 plus one. When you get the next upgrade, summon monster three, you get three choices now. And from this point on, with all those summon monsters, as well as summon uh, nature's allies three through nine, you get choices, three choices. You need to get one badass pet, one to three okay pets, and one D4 plus one lame ass pets. But you can flood the battlefield this way. And this is why these become of value. Because if you summon them in a mass of bad guys, they won't necessarily, because you can't control them, they don't necessarily all go and mug one dude. They do have a tendency of doing that, but if you summon them in a mass crowd of bad guys, they will just turn tail and go whichever fucking direction makes sense to them. So they'll go to this guy, that guy, they'll split their attention. One pet, obviously, can only go to one guy. One to three pets, plus one, will go to multiple guys, hopefully, but maybe just one dude again and just swarm a bastard. And that sometimes is of value, sometimes that's actually the worst thing you could possibly do. But notice that third category, the 1d4 plus one, Again, that's what the spell says. With superior summoning, it becomes 1d4 plus 2. And again, I can prove that to you. So again, if it's 1 to 4 with the die roll plus 1 normally, your range would be 2 to 5. So you should always be able to find 2, let's just say dogs again, or upwards of 5, no more. Well, because of superior summonings, I can guarantee you you're going to get 6 dogs if at some point. Because again, you'll roll the 5, and then another plus 1 brings it up to 6. And again, I know you'll get three dogs, but again, there, there's your logic. How did you get three? Did you roll a three? It should be a four. Did you roll a two? It could be a three. Well, here's the thing. You will never get two. And again, just like we saw with the 1d3 plus one with superior something kicking in to give it that plus one. That's something you'll see with the 1d4 plus two now because of superior something. So again... Great for a summoner build, a conjurer, a wizard, sorcerer. Hell, there's uh, uh, inquisitors that have summoning spells that are amazing. Druids have a lot of, you know, summon nature's ally. Good conjuration spells. And again, if you go spell focus conjuration, which you would need, because notice how augmented summoning needs spell focus conjuration. And to get superior summoning, you need augmented summoning, and of course, all the prerequisites for it. So that's already three feats now just to get to this guy. So uh, spell focus conjuration, augmented summoning, and superior summoning is usually a, a kit to me. It's like the, a, a standard way of me building a conjurer build. If I know I'm going to have summons and summons matter to me in any way, shape, or form, then this is something that will probably make the cut. Having said that, if you're literally just going to get like a pet... Uh, like, a, like a random summons. Like a, I have an Eldritch Scion build, for example, the Serpentine Bloodline, I believe it is. Uh, I make them a, usually a conjurer. They're actually very bad at it as far as summoning. And you may say, well, then why make them you know, an augmented summoning and superior summoning? Why would you even go that route? Well, they do give you a free spell, one spell. And again, that's terrible reasoning for this. But one spell is uh, Summon Monster 3. Again, your choice of, you know, do you want one lizard? Do you want uh, one to three wolves? Or do you want two to five dogs is what you have to choose from on that spell again with augmented summoning they would all be buffed for strength and deck or sorry strength and con with superior summoning with the exception of that single lizard the wolves or the dogs you will get an extra one and sometimes that helps but again it's one spell why waste a feed on something like one spell well there's other reasons for example i will pick other summoning spells sadly i have to wait to level 19 to do so also they give you something called Den of Vermin, another ability. It's not a spell, but it's more like a spell-like ability that is a summons, and it summons multiple, like, rat swarms. Okay, that's the Den of Vermin. So, the Den of Vermin summons, I want to say, four 
piles, and it really looks like piles, swirling masses of rats to attack bad guys. They'll poison them and bite them and do all kinds of nasty shit. Just like when you fought rats back in Kingmaker and they pissed you off. Same general principle here. It's very hard for them to be killed. It's not impossible. But it's one of those where it will piss off the bad guys. They don't, And again, they don't last long. And I think you only do it like once or twice a day. But they benefit from superior summoning. How do I know this? Because when you go from having four guaranteed swarms to now being five, and it's only because I picked up superior summoning, that's my proof. It's, again, a summons. And you have four pets, quote-unquote, because it's piles of pets. But it works again. So that's at least two reasons to want superior summoning then for that particular build, the Eldritch Scion. If uh, I wanted um, to go the Serpentine Bloodline for, say, a Sorcerer, on the other hand, they get even more. They get, like, another like summon monster 9 or some shit like that, some monster 7. So, again, another reason to want it. And for a Sorcerer build, you'd better believe that I would be picking, as I leveled up, summon monsters. Probably better than 3. A, we're getting 3 for free. So, summon monster 3 is already coming on the list. Summon monster 1 and 2, you're not that good at it. And they're not that great. They die very quickly, and again, one dog, who cares if it's got a plus four, a strength and a plus four, but con, it's not going to help you a ton. It may keep shit off you, sure, but it's still, it's smoke folk is what I call uh, some of the monster pets, because they're just there and they're, then they're gone. And they look like, at least back in King Day, they look like golden animals and, and pets that you summon, because they're always twinkle twinkly, so it's obvious that they're a summons. So, that's why I call them smoke folk. Good for a distraction, let's talk about where they're bad. A, if you're in a, a close quarters, uh, uh, it's annoying because they get in the way, but I think you can run around them. They, they probably made that uh, distinction now where they're not in the way. Uh, but I still maintain that I, it's one of those where they're going to surround a bad guy and it's going to be hard for your team to get there, especially meleeers, to get to that bad guy and beat on him if they're surrounded by pets. The other is if a bad guy, and I found this out in Kingmaker, if the bad guy has something like cleaves, great cleave, cleaving finish, and especially improved cleaving finish, your smoke folk are going to die very quickly, and they'll get free attacks then on you or whoever else is within range that's on your party that you didn't want to have attacked. So you can see the problem here. Use the pets at range to contain, if you will, the bad guy. Yes, they may die in a round, all of them. That sucks. But you and your team are standing back and blasting or shooting with whatever ranged attacks you can do, so you're not getting cleaved. So again, there's ways around it, but just know that they are going to be fodder. They are there for a purpose, and that purpose is not to kill these bad guys. It's to slow those bad guys and keep them to the other side of the fucking map because they're that goddamn scary. So these are decent upgrades. Just not amazing in my estimation. There's still plenty of times where I've played, especially the Inquisitor builds where they have, a, I think it's called Monster Tactician, where they get for free the best version of the summoning spells, in my opinion. Not not the highest level. Not summon Monster 70 or 9, not... Summon Nature's Ally, 7, 8, or 9. No, they get 1 through 6. However, their summons, uh, instead of it being one round per caster level, uh, the Monster Tactician gets what you would want to have on a, a Conjurer, like a Sorcerer proper, or even a Wizard, I suppose, for that matter, a Conjurer specifically. You would want to be able to summon them for one minute per caster level. That's what they get, which is why the, the Monster Tactician back in Kingmaker Day was King. For the longest time, because you could just be like, at level one, yeah, you got summon monster, uh, and you also got the summon monster spells or spell like ability, I should say, for free. So you got summon monster one at level one inquisitor, you know, because you were a monster tactician inquisitor, and you already had a pet that you could summon once, maybe even multiple times a day, and it would last for a minute if he didn't die. So it was another teammate on the battlefield, which really ruined the game for a lot of people. Not, not ruined in a bad way, like made it trivially easy. Because you could just, again, flood the battlefield with just pets. Every time another one died, just summon another one. You had like three, four, five castings of that shit a day. Bring out another guy. Hey, he did his job. All right, go back and uh, here, here's your new replacement and send him back out to do his thing. So you could have some fun. And then when you started to upgrade and get things like augmented summoning, they were tougher. They were stronger. They hit harder. They did more damage. Uh, so, again, they were a, a better upgrade. Then you get superior summoning where, again, you started summoning multiple dogs, wolves, lizards, whatever... And again, you start getting one extra if you pick the right spell uh, or subclass of that spell to cast. Remember, if you summon one of anything, and that includes, again, like our summon elementals where you only summon one, you ain't getting a superior summoning to kick in. 
because you're getting one and you're done. Yes, augmented summoning still benefits you, so there's still reason to go that route. But the question then becomes, do you need to have this one? I still maintain that you should. If you're going to be any kind of conjurer, you're probably going to get the better versions, like Summon Monster 3 on up. And why not have something that gets, gets you one extra person or pet on the battlefield? So again, a solid choice. This is one of those that falls in the questionable category, but Augmented Summoning, certainly you can see the appeal for this one. It's not much of an investment. You are going to get Spell Focus Conjuration. Hopefully, whatever class you are, you have Conjuration spells in it that have a DC check, because otherwise Spell Focus Conjuration doesn't do you a damn bit of good. But almost always, I can't say always, because I haven't tested it for everything, but almost everybody that has the ability to summon monsters or uh, elementals or nature's ally or anything similar you know a conjuration spell now remember undead doesn't count um will have a a conjuration spell or several conjuration spells that have a dc check so you're not feeling like you're an idiot for grabbing spell focus conjuration let's just be clear now that's already 20 minutes in and we've barely scratched the surface on this one so i already see that we're going to break this up into three videos this will just be for the spell stuff today what else do we have what about combat casting? Again, you know, see, I'm skipping around, but I'm trying to go alphabetical. What about combat casting? Is combat casting worth a damn? <sighs> this was is the one that it falls into the either it's a question mark or a dash. It's either complete lame sauce or it is situational at best. Because what does this do? This only gives you a bonus on concentration checks. Well, that sounds good. I'm a spellcaster. Why wouldn't I not want to have a better concentration check? Concentration in this game only works when you've been distracted or threatened, which means basically you've been attacked if you're never attacked or you're smart enough to stay the fuck back and not get attacked because you've got good distance from the bad guys that the archers aren't shooting at you maybe you're invisible so the archers don't even see your happy ass you don't really need it right when you it's it's if it's like a, a sub pump for those of you that want a, a real world analogy when you need it you'll know and that's the best advice i can give you for combat casting and there's other uh, classes, another example, again, back to my Magi uh, list, you know, my Magus, I love my Magus. Uh, there's um, a lot of different Magi, especially Eldritch Cyan, that get the equivalent of combat casting. They don't call it that, but it's a concentration bonus, and that's all the combat casting is. It's not a toggle, you don't turn it on, it's just there. So anytime you see plus two, plus one, plus four, or whatever, to your concentration checks, know that it will stack with combat casting. Remember, it's a die roll to see if you keep the spell. For those of you that don't know, if you fail your concentration check, if someone smacks you around while you're in the same round of you trying to cast a spell, uh, so like they hit you first and now it's your turn to cast a spell, you've been distracted. Now you do a concentration check. If you fail it, you waste your spell. So you can see why people would be like, well, certainly I don't want to waste my spell. Spells are precious. And I want to make sure they all land. So this is a way to make sure that they're casted properly. Again, it's not a guarantee. Also, if you're careful, you don't need this. So I, again, it's of value sometimes, but it's certainly not something that is a must-have. Let's put it that way. What's next on our list? We have our, uh, let's skip to our elemental foci. These ones, again, fall under the situational category to, to being very good. And it depends on how you play your character. If, for example, you play a sorcerer. Wizards are awesome, and uh, wizards can get all the spells that sorcerers can get, if I'm not mistaken, in this game. So there's no difference there. But I say sorcerer because you are going to probably focus on something. Maybe you're an acid-casting son of a bitch. Maybe cold damage is your thing. You're like a cold witch-type character. Maybe fire, because it's like one of the most dominant spells in the game, and you want to make sure it fucking hits. Elemental focus, and of course it's big brother, greater elemental focus, for the same element, fire, would be amazing for you. So if you're going to spam fire spells that, that you know have a DC check, that's a key here, because Scorching Ray, no check. Hellfire Ray, there's no saving throw on that shit. So if that's what we're talking about here. If there's no saving throw, then you don't need this. They may unlock things, so let's be real clear here. You can see uh, this one unlocks very element to focus fire. So again, the Big Brother version, the only way to get it is to grab the lesser version. No surprise. And it's a plus one to the DC check with its, the second upgrade to it. It's a plus two. Again, is that game breaking? Not really. But again, uh, I have maintained, for example, Elemental Focus Cold is like the second most uh, elemental damage type out there, at least for wizards and sorcerers. So cold damage is a good pick. Also, there's a lot of, of fun to be had for a character that uh, specializes with, for example, an element. 
you are a cold caster, especially if, like, as a sorcerer, you get pick a bloodline where you cast a lot of spells that they, they give you for free, for example, that are cold spells. For example, maybe you're an elemental bloodline was water. That's the cold element. So literally, they give you uh, spells like burning hands. However, they modify it, where burning hands is what it's called, but it'll say cold. It will do cold damage. It'll have cold, not fire, in the descriptor, and therefore, elemental focus cold will benefit from it. But there's another trick, and people, I need to point you out on this just to, to warn you away from something. For at least Eldritch Science, and I would assume the same is applicable for Sorcerers, those elemental, uh, again, you have one for air, that's electric damage, uh, fire is obvious, water is cold, as I just stated, and of course, earth, which is acid, which, again, doesn't really track to me, but whatever. Point is, that's your four elemental bloodlines that you could pick. They also, not only do they give you those spells that, again, are like acid, for burning hands but it's acid because you're an earth elemental they give you an acid scorching ray so instead of it doing fire damage again no saving throw there but it does acid damage instead of fire damage it's the same with the electrical so the air elemental they get burning hands but it does electric damage and it's an electrical attack and therefore elemental focus electricity would benefit it the scorching ray again they get scorching ray for free as they level up but it's the electrical version and so we'll say electrical and descriptor However, there's no saving throw, so again, it doesn't benefit it. But, what you're not seeing, and again, some kind of a mistake in my opinion, I have bug reported it, just so we're clear. Feel free to do the same uh, if you see it. So again, don't bug report it just off of my say, so prove it to yourself, test it yourself, see that it's not there. Uh, when you level up, you'll notice when you pick a bloodline, they usually tell you what free shit you get down here. There's also a list here that you can scroll up and down at like level one you'll get this level two you'll get that and etc and so forth on this list you'll see something that's not on this list which is annoying to me because this is the one that you know it pops out and you look at it and go oh this is what i'm getting okay cool I, I like this stuff this looks interesting to me no one reads down the list and scrolls up and down well most people don't i'd say they just pop open the, the big picture and say oh here's my big picture this is what i'm going to get okay cool the thing you're getting here that doesn't show up here but does happen you do get it at level one you get this thing called like elemental arcana which allows you to take whatever element you associate with again there's the air for electric fires for fire waters for cold air earth is acid you turn on a toggle any damaging spell or most i should say damaging spells that you cast now do your elemental type of damage so if you want an acid fireball you just be an earth elemental uh bloodline Turn on that toggle, get the spell called Fireball, and cast it. It will do acid damage. Boom. 10d6 of acid damage, best case scenario. Lightning Bolt. You want that to do cold damage because you just want to be a jackass and shoot a beam of cold at somebody you know, that does 10d6 of cold damage? Again, be the water elemental category. And literally, you'll shoot it out with that toggle running, and it will do all cold damage. But now, here's why I'm warning you. When you use the toggle... It does the damage we talked about. And again, if you have bonus to acid damage or whatever, you will get that bonus. But you will not get a bonus to, say, the DC check of the acid fireball. It still thinks it's fire. Again, that should be maybe uh, exhibited as a bug report. I don't know. I, I can't say as I care. It's one of those, though, that if you're looking for a high DC bill, you know, something that where all the spells are going to land, because that's the thing, then this is a problem because acid is underrepresented in this game electricity is probably the second most underrepresented in this game for elemental damage at least for the wizards and sorcerers and having the ability to turn it into electrical fireballs or, or you know acid um, cone of colds and, and shit of that nature and you'd be like yeah fucking suck on my acid damage you know it's cool but you're not increasing the dc check if you focus on acid again so it's counterintuitive Weirdly, when I make builds like that, I will, if I care about the DC check, I'll either focus on Elemental Focus Fire or Elemental Focus Cold. Even if I'm an Acid Elemental, like an Earth Elemental, or an Air Elemental, where, again, electricity is my jam, I still make these my Elemental Focus. Why? Because, again, if it keys off of it being cold, even though I'm turning it into electric or acid damage with my little toggle, I'd rather have the high, high DC check. And again, there's a lot of good cold spells in the game. There's a ton of fire spells in the game. So again, either of those are solid choices for you. Just know that. And apparently we are being bombarded by the fucking Germans or something. I don't know what the hell. So, oh, it's Tuesday. Shit. We have a beginning of the month Tuesday tornado warning. Anyway, um, that's my spiel on elemental focus and great amount of focus. Again, good. Mm, great. Nah. But 
again, if you're a specialist, if you were that guy or gal that li literally you got, you're going to be a sorcerer or an elder scion that, again, cold or fire damage is your jam. Hey, man, grab that shit. And uh, on a side note, in these categories, routinely, again, you can find my old Kingmaker data because uh, you know, my videos for Kingmaker because I've done this and, and talked about this as well. Uh, for the spells, especially for like the Elder Scion, the, the Magi, I have a, a laundry list of spells and I break them down by category for how many are acid spells, cold, electric, fire, because I want to know that information. And I'll usually like have a, a, a trick. I'm like the Batman, the MacGyver of the Wizarding World, where I have a trick for every occasion. So I have enough acid spells, cold spells, electric, and fire spells to cover my bases, is usually the way I make my characters. Having said that, um, I also break down not only how many acid spells there are, but I break down what schools they fall in, Conjuration being a biggie. Uh, I find out also how many of those acid spells, whether they're Conjuration, Evocation, Transmutation, you know, wherever the fuck they land, how many have a saving throw? And you may say, well, again, why do you give a shit about that? Well, because I need to know if I'm going to have a lot of acid spells, that have a lot of DC checks, maybe I really should get Elemental Focus Acid. Turns out there's not many. And routinely, not all, but routinely you'll find that your Acid spells don't have a save. They also don't have spell resistance in many cases. Again, not all, but many. So if you need to do a subpar build, again, like an Eldritch Scion, like I usually do a Dragon a Disciple Dip, or like a big 10-10 split, where I'll do 10 levels of Sorcerer, 10 levels of Dragon Disciple, or in my case, usually 10 levels of Eldritch Scion, Dragon Disciple, 10 levels of it. And I'll go Acid. Why? Because if my spell uh, caster level, and again, that's how you get over spell resistance, is having a high caster level as well as spell penetration and greater spell penetration, which we'll talk about here in a minute. If you play Dragon Disciple, you lose out on three caster levels if you go 10 levels into it. Well, actually, if you go 9 levels into it, but most people, if they go 9, they're going 10. Point is, you'll finish at caster level 17, not 20, Oh shit, that's not cool. Well, yes and no. I mean, it's cool because what does 10 levels of Dragon Disciple give you? A fucking shit ton of things like armor, strength, con, intelligence, weirdly. I don't know. Dragon claws that fucking do, or no, dragon bite, excuse me, that does elemental damage of your type of dragon. So in our case, let's say acid, because maybe you went black dragon, which is again one of my favorites. And again, you may say, why do I need to know that information? Well, for one, Dragon Disciples. Um, Add up to there's there's spell casting progression and the, the free spells and abilities that they get for the draconic bloodlines. So if you have say um, a black dragon and you want to get all those cool spells as a sorcerer at the you know level seven eight nine, but you're like oh gee if I dip ten levels of dragon disciple I'm losing out on all those spells. No you're not. You get all that shit and then some. So it still stacks and there's reasons to like that. Again your caster level sucks. Your spell progression sucks. Hey man, I can't help you there. But what I can do is tell you that Acid is a solid choice. Why? Because, again, if it ignores spell resistance, your caster level rarely matters. I mean, yeah, 17 casting versus the 20 kind of sucks because who wouldn't rather have a spell last 20 minutes versus 17 or 20 hours versus 17 hours? So, again, there's that. Some of your spells won't do full damage because, again, they have to do 20d6 of damage. Take, take Chain Lightning as an example. It does 1d6 per caster level. If your caster level 17... Even if you're an electric dragon type, like a blue dragon, you're only doing 17d6 of damage, not 20d6. Man, that sucks. Okay, there's nothing I can do about that. Well, there is, but I'm not going to tell you. Point is, uh, you have to make concessions. You decide, all right, I'm going to be a subcaster. However, I'm going to be a badass dragon-looking dude, and I'm going to turn into a dragon like all the time, still casting my spells, still being a badass that I am, and my spells are going to be acid or cold or electric or fire because that's the type of dragon that I am. I'm going to go all in on that. Now, Elemental Focus Acid and Greater Elemental Focus Acid kind of makes sense. And again, knowing what school they belong to, like again, Conjuration, but again, not all, kind of makes sense. Because what school or, or spell focus would I get? Remember, that's based on your school. Your Abjuration, Conjuration, etc. and so forth. And again, Conjuration's there. So if you know that you're going to have a lot of Conjuration spells and you're going to lean heavy into it, that Black Dragon build was a solid Conjurer. So that's kind of on you. I can't tell you what to do. I can just show you that they will stack. Notice, uh, for all of these, just to be clear here, Evocation is almost always a solid bet. 
to stack with this. So if you went spell focus evocation and greater spell focus evocation, and then went into say elemental focus fire or cold or electric or acid, you're probably not screwing yourself that much because there's a lot of evocation spells. You're probably going to lean heavy into evocation, assuming that it's not like a, a, a penalty school for you. So there's plenty of evocation spells, and most of those do damage, and many of those damage types are elemental. On that list, I can tell you right now, fire is going to be heavily represented, being cold being the second best category. So again, if you want to be a fire evoker or a cold evoker, it makes sense. Electricity, not so much. There's some in there. No, don't kid yourself. It's better than acid at the very least. But, but what's in there? Let's just rattle off ones that are in my brain that are electric damaging spells, and let's see if any of them have uh, saving throws. Jolt, your cantrip, no saving throw. Uh, shocking grasp, good electric damage, no saving throw. How about, uh, when's the next one? Probably Lightning Bolt at level 3. That's a saving throw. Okay, there's one. What about Dragon's Breath? Dragon's Breath is the catch-all. It's why I grab that spell every time it's available to me. If it's not for free, I pick it up. Why? Because I can breathe acid, cold, electric, or fire damage with that spell. So that's one of the rare exceptions to the rule where acid falls under the evocation category. There's like maybe one other in there. But by and large, they're usually conjuration spells. This is one of those exceptions to the rule. But again, fits every category, which is really nice. So if you want to be an electrical evoker, that's a possibility. So we have Lightning Bolt already. we got Dragon's Breath already. So that's two possible electric spells right there. What else is in there? Chain Lightning is in there. That's an electric damaging spell. There's a DC check on that. So there we go. So we're up to three. What else? Can't think of a lot more. I mean, I'm sure there is. I just... It's not hitting my brain. It's probably like storm bolts or something like that is in there. Maybe for a wizard or a sorcerer. I can't remember if they get it at the high level because I don't usually play those characters. But it's there. It's just not a lot. Whereas fire, I can start rattling off things. I got burning hands. I got burning arc. Those are two that have saving throws. Scorching rain, no saving throw, but it's a fire damaging spell. We have fireball, of course. We got controlled fireball. We got that uh, aforementioned dragon's breath. I have Sirocco. I have transmutation spells that are fire damage. Again, key off of elemental focus fire, like uh, uh, Obsidian Flow at level four. At level six, you have uh, Sirocco, uh, which is an evocation, but also a transmutation spell called Tar Pool that does fire damage. And again, all those are based on elemental focus fire. Those will benefit. So if you wanted again evoker fire, you're covering a lot. And know that there are going to be spells, just like I mentioned, the Obsidian Flow and Tar Pool are transmutation spells. But they're fire spells as well. So while your spell focus evocation doesn't do you a lick of good against those two spells, at least your elemental focus fire and greater elemental focus fire gave you a little bit of juice, right? So again, this is how I would build a character if it's going to be a caster type, looking for these things to say, hey, is this matter to me? Is this something that I'm really going to lean heavy into? Can I pick him up as free feats down here so I don't have to burn my precious feats up here? Because again, you want to be at least some kind of combatant. Even if you are a caster, even if you're a pansy-ass cleric who doesn't have armor and doesn't like to swing a weapon, you're probably wielding a crossbow. So having things like at least point-blank shot and precise shot, that's two feats taken from your list already. So this is why I say it's kind of important that you guys know what feats matter. You know? So again, that covers our elemental focus and greater uh, elemental focus in a nutshell. And again, notice that they stack one with the other. So plus one to your DC check or plus two if you get the, the greater version. Um, and you can get all of them if you wanted to get nuts. And there's four here and four here. You can grab all if you wanted to. It seems silly to me, but again, that's the possibility. Same with your spell focus. Now, on spell focus, uh, and I know we're skipping around a little bit here, but again, on spell focus, since we're talking about bonus to your DC checks, this is the other one that does that. Notice that we have every school associated with this. And again, there doesn't have to be a wizard or a sorcerer that gets these. This could totally be a bard. This could be a paladin, weird as it may be. could be a freaking ranger. could be a, a cleric, a druid. Again, other caster types that are in the game, you know, like my Elder Scions. Know what your spell list is, is the first advice I have to you for here. Second, know that there's some divination looking right the fuck at you that are complete stupid ideas. It's not to say there's not a divination spell in the game that has a DC check. There's like one, maybe two. I just haven't checked the entire list for all the different spell books. But for like wizards and sorcerers, there's like one. It's like prediction of failure or some shit like that. And it's, it's the only divination spell you'll get that has a DC check. So getting a spell focus in it seems kind of stupid. Now, I'm not saying that you won't have fun doing that. <clears throat> Maybe you're playing the theme. Maybe it's something that matters to you. And again, I'm not trying to steer you away from it. It's more of a, I know me, 
If it's only going to benefit one spell, what's the chance I'm going to burn a very special feat pick on it? Probably not going to happen. On this other list, what else would fall in that category of stupid? Abjuration is one of the ones that it's kind of hard to make a case for. There are some abjuration spells, there's not many, that have a DC check. Stunning Barrier being the one that pops in my brain. And again, it's a garbage spell. But, again, I'm not telling you how to play your character. Maybe you wanted to be an abjurer, a team buffer. You know, that's your thing. And again, as a wizard, maybe if, if it's a... a point of pride for you because not only are you a wizard maybe you're a specialist wizard which you can be and you pick abjuration as your school i wouldn't but maybe you do and that's free abjuration spells so you said you know what maybe i should get spell focus abjuration i mean it, it, i am an abjurer it seems weird not to get it so i'm going to grab it again i'm not going to tell you don't i'm going to tell you it's not going to be very valid on these other ones though uh, conjuration Enchantment, Evocation, Illusion, Necromancy, and Transmutation, all of those have lots of spells in them. Lots of them have DC checks in them. Again, if you're doing a, a specific build, like me when I play uh, Eldritch Scions, know that we don't get a lot of spells that are Illusion or Enchantment in our upgrade unless they're provided to us for free, you know, like our free uh, spells from our bloodline from an Eldritch Scion standpoint. You only get like a handful of Enchantment spells ever. And then B, the, the, the two illusion spells that you do get that have a DC check, they're not the best. I think it's like Color Spray and, and um, Phantasmal Killer are the two that you could pick as an Elder Sign just for free as you level up normally. Yeah, yeah, you'd benefit by being illusion, you know, spell focus illusion, greater spell focus illusion, of course, too. And I've done those builds. But when you're really capitalizing on then is you know, like maybe you're going to take the trickster mythic path. Remember, there's two different spell books you're going to have access to probably in this game. Your your traditional spell book from your character and your spell book from your mythic path, which may or may not be combined. Well, for Elder Scion, you don't get to combine any of your spell books. So you literally have your spell book and then whatever mythic path you pick. I'd pick trickster if I was going to be an illusionist. Why? Because they give a boatload of illusion spells, like some of the best ones. Shadow Conjuration, Greater Shadow Conjuration. You can get... Um, Evocate, uh, shadow Evocation and Greater Shadow Evocation, I believe, as well. That's a lot right there, just for those four spells. And they give you even more than that. And all have a DC check with them. So again, you can see how Spell Focus and Greater Spell Focus Illusion is a solid choice. Enchantment. Again, I don't normally get enchantment spells for free as I level up. Depends on my bloodline. But even on the best case scenario, I think the only bloodlines that have ever given me like decent... Like you would use from the start of the game when you get the spells to the end of the game. Where... The spells are still valid. I think like Fey might get like an illusion, or sorry, an enchantment spell or two that's of value, or a spell like ability for that matter. Uh, uh, also, the infernal bloodline, the devil bloodline, not demons, that's the abyssal. The infernal bloodline the, is the devil bloodline, and the devil bloodline, they get a lot of weird enchantments as well, like whole person, mind fog, just to name the two that pop into my brain. And again, more if you're playing a sorcerer, less if you're playing an elder scion. But again, the difference there is sorcerers can pick whatever they want as they level up. So if you want to be an illusionist sorcerer that didn't get free illusion spells uh, from your bloodline, that's your prerogative. For an elder scion, that's more picky. You don't get very many spells that are illusion. The ones you do get, again, like I said, are kind of crappy. The other illusions you do get um, that do not benefit from spell focus or greater spell focus in the slightest are things like blur, vanish, greater invis. You'll have access to them, mirror image, etc. and so forth. Sure. But they're buff spells. They have nothing to do with the DC check. So, again, less important or impactful to me. So, again, my, my advice here to you is know what spells you have access to. Kind of pre-plan out your build for what, especially when it's a, a, a spontaneous caster build. That's the last thing to really point out here for this. Like an Inquisitor, uh, Eldritch Scion, a Sorcerer, uh, Oracle. I'm sure there's another one that I'm... Bard. There you go. I'm sure there's others that I'm missing. Blood Rager, I'm sure, is another one. When you know what your list is and that you're only going to get to pick a small number of spells from each of that spell levels, level 1, 2, 3, 4, and on up, depending on what class you're playing, you really need to be choosy, right? You need to say, I'm going to be Damage Man. Cool. Hey, you're Blood Rager. I fucking get it. Let's fucking sling out some lightning bolts and some fireballs. Let's, let's wreak some fucking own holy havoc into this house. That's what we do. We're blood Raging. I get it. You probably want then Evoker. I mean, you, you can make a case for either uh, necromancy, transmutation, uh, or conjuration, but evoker is usually where it's at. 
okay? It's not to say that, again, there's not reasons to want the other ones. Do you want more than one spell focus is another viable option. I have done builds where I've done illusion and enchantment because I know that I was going to couple those spells together uh, for a, a valid reason. One, for example, I was a gnome, so I got a bonus to illusion right off the bat. Two, I was getting a lot of enchantment spells that I knew were powerful, and I want them to land. So again, spell focus, greater spell focus, enchantment. That's a thing. So I would double up on some of these sometimes. I would not try to do it on every build, like being a conjurer who evokes damage as well. Seems weird. You probably want to lean into one more than the other. Because again, there's this pretty, pretty greater spell focus. And then, of course, our elemental focus, especially if you're an evoker. Because you're probably, not always, but you're probably using those spells to do elemental damage. So again, what element? Okay, so now, again, we've talked about all these in a nutshell. Again, best, I can't tell you. I know worst. Divination, second worst, abjuration is probably on your list. And again, for my Eldritch Scion, I could just as easily say divination and abjuration suck. Same like enchantment. And again, you say why? Because again, we don't get enchantment spells. Same with like illusion. I get only two illusion spells as I level up if I pick them. And that's not good to like get spell focus and greater spell focus illusion. I've done those builds and I maintain that they're solid choices. But the trick for me is when I leveled up that Elder Scion, I was an arcane bloodline. And that levels, for those of you who don't know, 9 and 13 and 17, you get one free spell pick at each of those levels because of your arcane bloodline and you can pick any wizard spell that you could cast so at level nine you can cast only levels one two or three at levels 13 you can cast one through five at level 17 you can cast all of them one through six that's the highest casting cast uh, spell level that you can cast as an elder scion so why do i point that out to you because one through nine or sorry one through three for the level nine free pick could include a, a good illusion spell level 13 definitely will because one through five that's almost all your spells and again if it's all wizard spells that opens a boatload of shit that's why i also have done enchantment builds for an elder scion again with the arcane bloodline lots of possibilities happen so i know the mechanics of that bloodline that level 17 free spell yes it's late in the game but hey man that's any wizard spell one through six that opens a pandora's box of ass whoopery for me spells like shadow evocation shadow conjuration may fall in there definitely shadow evocation does um, and I just can't remember if they do Shadow Conjuration or, shat or Greater Shadow Conjuration. But I know they get something. And again, some really good illusion spells at those points. So at 13 and 17, you better believe those are probably going to be illusion picks for me if I'm going to go an illusionist route. And again, a lot of people will quibble and say, well, that's stupid to fucking build for the end of the game. Yeah, but I had a theme in mind. I was playing a gnome. I like being the teeny tiny character where there's a high bonus to charisma, high bonus to con, bonus to all my illusion spells. And yes, remember, I had color spray and uh, phantasmal killer as I leveled up. So it's not like I had none. It's not like I went to an enchanter build and got jack because that sucks. And I've done those builds too. But again, with a, a theme in mind. Were they the best builds ever? No. Were they fun for me? Yes. And that's all that really matters at the end of the day. On to our list. What else do we have? So we've talked about our spell foci, our elemental foci, our summoning upgrades, combat casting. Let's talk about, before we do the, the biggie, the metamagics, let's talk about spell pen, greater spell pen, and spell specialization. So what does spell pen and greater spell pen do? So there's a spell resistance uh, check in the game. Uh, and it won't show us here. Notice the way it works is they have a number, spell resistance, 10, 5, a billion, whatever it is, and demons have a lot of it, which we're fighting routinely in Wrath of the Righteous. So this is going to be important. There's feats, there's classes that gets the equivalent of spell pen, which is this guy down here, a plus two to your check for free, and they stack. What do I mean stack? Spell pen, if I pick that, that would also give me another plus two. Same with greater spell pen. If you grab it, it gives you another plus two including the fact that, of course, you have to have spell pen to get greater spell pen. So that's plus two, that's plus four. And again, if I was, uh, I want to say it's the elf, they get spell pen for free. Not, or not the feat, excuse me. They get the equivalent of spell penetration for free. So if they grab both of these feats, spell pen, greater spell pen, and were an elf, they'd have a plus six to their spell, uh, um, spell pen check, their spell resistance check, I should say. What is this, the spell resistance? Again, different for every bad guy. But how do you penetrate it? You cast a spell on the guy. If spell resistance is applicable, which is important, 
you will say, oh, he has spell resistance. Do I counter it? Well, I roll my caster level. Remember, if you are a subcaster, I talked about reasons that being a subcaster sucks, like my Dragon Disciple 10 level dip, which is not a dip. Let's just say it. At that level, you're, you're committed. But remember, I can finish at a caster level 17, not 20. So if at the end of the game, you're a 10-10 split, like I've done in the past, you're 17 for your caster level. And it doesn't matter if I'm a level 17 Elder Scion or if I'm a level 17 Sorcerer. Yeah, there's more spells for the Sorcerer, but it's still based on caster level, not the spell you're casting. So if I'm casting a level 1 spell or a level 9 spell, don't matter. It's what's your caster level. So my caster level 17, 1, 20, 30, which does exist in this game now, which is fucking awesome. You can see how much fun you can have with this. Now, having said that, that's your first number here. That you can't control so much as it's just determined by the fact that you're caster level X by the time you're attacking that bad guy. But you also roll 1d20. And any bonuses, of course, get tacked onto this. This is where spell pen, greater spell pen, and other feats and, and race bonuses kick in. So it, it gets added to your caster level. So again, for my elf level 20 wizard, uh, and that has spell pen and greater spell pen, they'd have a caster level 20 plus 6 for spell pen plus 2. Greater spell pen, another plus two. Being an elf, another plus two. That's plus six right there. So we're 26 technically on this side already. Now remember, all you have to do is equal to or exceed their spell resistance. It's the equivalent of magic armor, right? So just like their armor class, same general principle here. And your attack is your 1d20 roll. And this is, when I say attack, I don't mean your raid touch attack or your um, uh, melee touch attack. I, I literally mean this is just how we penetrate it. So it's, it's a very analogous to a, an attack bonus against someone's armor class. Their armor class is spell resistance. Your attack bonus is all these cool bonuses you got here and your 1d20 die roll. Now, you can roll a 1. There is not, as far as I know, a crit failure for penetrating spell resistance. So if you had, let's say, he had a spell resistance of 20, your number over here is 19 and I rolled a 1, that'd be 20. 1 plus 19 is 20. That'd be enough to penetrate it. And I don't think you have a crit failure on those. So know that's the thing. And also there is not a guaranteed you will pass it. Which means if you're caster level 1, because you're a level 1 character, and you happen to roll a 20, that's 20 and 1, that's 21. That's awesome, right? For a level 1 character, that's as good as it gets, baby, without, you know, spell pen and greater spell pen and what have you. That's pretty fucking high. What if the demon you're fighting at level 1 just happened to have a, a spell resistance of 33? You don't auto-pass that. There is no crit success either. So don't think you're getting a 20 going, yeah, nope, don't work. So be real clear here. Now... Is this something I routinely grab on my bills? No, for, for two reasons. One, I routinely play characters that are not full casters. Uh, I'm not a wizard, I'm not a sorcerer, I'm not a cleric or a druid or any oracle, any of those guys that get up to caster level 20. Uh, I can get, sure, but I'm casting spells level 1 through 6, not 1 through 9. And that's a terrible reason for not grabbing spell pen and great, uh, greater spell pen, by the way. Because again, remember, all your spells could fall in that category of you know, spell resistance is applicable. But what I do, and this is where you need to pay attention, what I do is I make sure whatever spells I get as I level up that I at least have a few that have no spell resistance in the tool tip. Some of these are broken. I have reported them. An example of one right off the top of my head is Dragon's Breath. Amazing wizard, sorcerer, and eldritch scion magus spell. Level 4 spell. Four different elements you can choose from in different shapes to those breaths as well. It could be a long beam, sure, like a, a blue lightning beam from a blue dragon, sure. Can it be a cone? In some cases, yes. Some get both. Like I can even, I'd be like a, a cold spell or a fire uh, dragon type that does a cone or a fire dragon type that does a beam. There's two different types of dragon that do that. Uh, there's only like one electric. It's always a beam. There's only one... Um, cone, or one for cold damage, and that's always a cone. The acid one does have a beam and does have a spray that's an AoE cone. So, there's some flexibility, if you will, there. But again, why do I mention this? Because the spell routinely, all the way back in Kingmaker and to this day, still has the same problem, where it says in the tooltip, spell resistance is not applicable, which means there's no spell resistance on the bad guy, or even if they do have it, it doesn't matter. That's a bullshit lie. They just need to change the tooltip. That's why I've submitted a bug report. I mean, if, if it's supposed to be there's no spell resistance, then they need to fix the spell. But if at the very least, fix the tooltip if you're not going to fix that. Because, again, when I pick that spell, I'm like, yeah, I don't need to worry about those dragons and their stupid fucking spell resistance or whatever. Fuck you, demon. 
I'm picking Dragon's Breath. Awesome. And then you cast it on the motherfucker says, oh, you don't penetrate their spell resistance. What? Oh, motherfucker. Yeah, it's annoying. So again, know your spells. Know which ones are broken. Again, I'm telling you about one right now. But test that shit out if you can. And sometimes you can. So let me give you one that I guarantee you has no spell resistance and you love. Matter of fact, I'll give you three different categories. Uh, conjuration spells by and large. Not all. Many. And again, we talked about this when we talked about our acid elemental ones, right? Um, but conjuration spells by and large are physical substances. And one isn't even acid damage, I can tell you about. And it's called snowball it's level one spell damn it and it's awesome it's a raised spell or a ranged touch attack so you got to be good at hitting things with it but so again you could miss but you wing that motherfucker in the face with that thing and upwards of 5d6 of cold damage now that shit's baller and there's a saving throw so again if you wanted elemental focus cold it would work on that spell you can't put spell focus evocation on that one because again it's a conjuration spell but there's not very many cold conjuration spells in the game, just so we're clear. So I would not go spell focus conjuration, greater spell focus conjuration, elemental focus cold, greater elemental focus cold. There's reasons to do it. It's not the best reasons. If you wanted to be a good conjuration build, again, we've stated already, go spell focus conjuration, greater spell focus conjuration, if you can fit it in the build, of course. Get yourself augmented summoning. If you're going to summon pets at all, especially the level uh, three spells on up, uh, and superior summoning, again, if you feel you want it. If that's your cup of tea, that's four feats right there. That's a lot of feats, man. But worth. If you really wanted to go all in on that and get some elemental focus for it, again, we've said it before. What's the best probable category for DC checks that do elemental damage that also fall under the spells of conjuration? Acid. Why? Because it's a physical substance. It's a conjuration. The thing that I argue about, and I've done so before, they fixed it for this game, by the way. Doesn't I don't think they've ever fixed it on Kingmaker. Uh, routinely, you will be annoyed by the fact that if you come across bad guys that have spell resistance in Kingmaker, you're down to like your last spells. Like maybe you're using your cantrips now. Maybe you're an Eldritch Scoundrel, where you have access to all the wizards' uh, cantrips, and you're just zipping out spells infinite use spells at range because you're you know, high dex, you maybe got spell fo or sorry uh, point blank shot, precise shot, you got really good aim, if you will, so you're likely to hit the target because it's a touch attack it's easy to hit those targets, and you can get sneak attack damage on some of those things if you set it up right. Well, what if you use acid splash? That's an infinite use cantrip and because it's a conjuration spell and acid, you would think, hey, this has no spell resistance, not in Kingmaker in this game, Wrath of the Righteous, they fixed it I don't know if it was supposed to be fixed, but I guess enough people bitched and said, hey, dude, this one's probably not supposed to have spell resistance. It's acid. How do you resist the spell of acid on your face? What the fuck? So they took it away. Ray of Frost still has spell resistance. Disrupt Undead, I believe, has spell resistance. Jolt, another damaging cantrip, has spell resistance. But Acid Splash in Wrath of the Righteous does not. However, there's also no DC check on it either. You hit or you miss... There's no saving throw, so elemental focus acid didn't do you a lick of good, did it? See that? Spell focus conjuration for that spell didn't do you a damn bit of good, did it? But look at some of the other spells that are acid. So again, we have Dragon's Breath could be acid. Elemental focus, greater elemental focus acid would benefit there. Not conjuration, because that's an evocation spell. Uh, another acid spell that's a conjuration spell together, Acid Pit. Amazing spell, especially if you're using turn-based combat where you can control your team a little bit, keep from being stupid. Acid Pit is an acid spell descriptor, and it's a conjuration spell. Better than that, acid, and all your pit spells for this matter, I believe, uh, have no uh, spell resistance. So if you're going to be a subcaster, again, like I maintained before with my Dragon Disciple build, and you can get those spells, acid spells and conjuration spells are almost always universally great in this regard. There's exceptions to the rule, and there's exceptions that like literally are good exceptions to the rule. Acid Arrow, level 2 spell that all Elder Scion have access to. Same with Sorcerers and Wizards. It's an amazing long range race spell. Great. Terrible damage. No spell resistance. Cool. So far, you got me on board. It is a conjuration spell. Again, awesome. There's no saving throw. So it doesn't matter that you have conjuration spell focus. It doesn't matter that you have elemental focus and acid. It does not have a save. Still want the spell. <laughs> Just saying. So again, there's there's ways to look at these things, right? So that's spell pen 
in a nutshell. And again, why in many of my builds, I don't grab it. Even on a sorcerer build, I routinely hate having to grab spell pen, creator spell pen. I probably will do a build in this game where I'm like, you know what, I, I want it. I know I'm, I'm, I'm the only caster, like the big caster on the team, and my spells need to land. And if you don't have spell pen and greater spell pen, or a nice plethora of spells that we just said that ignore spell resistance, you're going to be, what do I do now? I'm, I'm the buff bot for the team. Here's a spell for you, buddies. Here's a, you know, a, an AOE damaging spell or, or, or debuff to the bad guys. Let's hope that I pass the spell resistance check on at least a couple of those motherfuckers. I've done that too. Slow spells an amazing spell because it won't hurt your team. Can impact the bad guys. But again, spell resistance is applicable. And I've seen it flagged before where it says, did not pass, did not pass, did not pass. Motherfucker! And it sucks, man. I'm totally with you on that. It's it's almost the same feel when you don't have spell pen and greater spell pen to get over that shit as when you have a spell where the DC check, you're just not good enough to pass their saving throws. Like their, their, their saving throws are so much better than your DC check. And you're like, damn, I should have grabbed spell focus, greater spell focus, transmutation, or, or evocation, or whatever. If I could have just been a little bit better. You know, everyone chases that shit. And again, a fine example on those ones, really, uh, as much as you'd love to say evocation and conjuration, necromancy and transmutation are the go-to spells for damage and fun and shit like that, don't discount kind of losing an enchantment. The reason most people do is because routinely, and I, I, I want to say almost like 100% of the time, if, if not 100% of the time, those two categories of, of schools of spell uh, magic, they're like 90, let's just say 99.9% .9 of the time when it's an attack spell, there's a saving throw, if not more than one. So these are the ones that routinely you will fail and feel subpar. I did a whole video about illusion casting in Kingmaker. Feel free to watch that video. But I uh, reemphasize my point here for this video for this reason. A routine problem people have with illusionists being on the team back in old D&D days is their spells early level seem weak sauce. They did minor effects, crowd control effects, shit that was distracting the bad guys. That's what illusionist does. Later, if you survive long enough, you become a, a like, I'm fucking killing everybody with their horrors and their nightmares and shit like that, and you just become a powerhouse. But until that time, the team fucking hates you. Let's just fucking say it. You know, I'm illusionist. Why don't you curse me a pretty bunny? Well, I'm fucking fighting you, jackass. Yeah, okay, fuck you. A, there's other illusion spells that are benefit. You know, invis. Greater Invis, uh, Mirror Image, Blur, Displacement. There's a really good buff spells in there. But as far as attack spells, I get it. The other part, same with Enchantment, falls under this category too. Is A, how did you know that I did the spell that killed that guy? You heard me talking, you saw me gesturing, you know I, the wizard, the illusionist, or the enchanter on the, the party, and I gave that guy a heart attack. He clutches his chest, he falls over. How do you know he doesn't eat a lot of fucking bacon today? You don't know. I mean, you're on my team. I'm telling you so. But again, you don't really know, do you? You didn't see a fireball hit the dude. You didn't see a dog gnaw his face off like a conjuration spell. You didn't see me raise the dead to fucking you know, chew on his ankles. You didn't see me turn him into a puppy. You saw me say some words, do the little twinkle twinkle with my fingers, and the dude drops over. Who did that? Was it me? Uh, I can take credit for it. But you don't know, do you? So here's the problem with illusion, especially enchantment. And in some cases, illusion is a little better than enchantment. And in, in the case that in illusion spells, sometimes everyone sees the illusion. In our game, uh, Phantasmal Killer, a fine spell. Uh, it, if you read the description of the spell, you go into the mind of your target. You take out a horror, something that scares them so much that if they fail both checks, there's two checks. There's, there's a will save and then a fortitude save. If they fail both... They keel over, die. Didn't matter if they had 100 health, they had 5 health. They fucking just keel over. We see it in this game. The illusion that they show you is it always looks the same. It's like a little purple ninja, like a samurai, whatever, comes out and he swings his sword at them. It looks lame as fuck. It, first couple times, you're like, cool. And then after that, you're like, really? Everyone's scared of the, the fucking samurai? What the hell? I, I wish they would change that. I know it's asking a lot, so I'm not going to bitch. But it's one of the, the bugaboos I have about that spell. Having said that, if you understand the nature of the spell, I think, and I could be wrong on this, but in pen and paper version of that spell, no one sees that illusion but your target. 
So, I mean, they show it to us in this game because, again, it's a visual game, obviously, right? So, again, you know, Pathfinder, Kingmaker, Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous. You want to see the guy die from the illusion, not just that he just fucking something either goes, oh, and falls over. They show you the, the purple samurai. Okay, fine. But in reality, in the fake reality of this game, no one should see that except for the target. You don't even know what his horror is, right? You're just pulling it out of his or her mind and poof, they're fucking dying if they fail both their checks. So, again... How would you know that the illusionist did anything? Really? Same with enchantment. I mean, heavy on the enchantment. And the worst part, the, 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 the elephant in the room, if you will, about these two, and to a lesser extent, some of these other uh, uh, schools of magic, but really enchantment and illusion, because there's routinely, like I said, 99.9 .9 or greater percent of the time, there's a saving throw. If it's an attack spell, Remember, you're pushing your will on someone, especially if it's an enchantment. That's the whole fucking point of an enchantment. I'm making you do shit you're not supposed to. You're paralyzed because I say so. You're my buddy because I say so. You fucking attack your friends because I fucking say so. But since there's a saving throw, and there's usually on those worst ones a saving throw every fucking round, eventually he's going to get over it, and he ain't going to be happy with you. And two, what happens on a... a, a crit success. Remember, if they roll a nat 20, doesn't matter how big my DC check was and how terrible his will save was. He passes. That's the same for enchantment and illusion. So what happens? Those are routinely, not always, but you know, illusion's probably a little bit better than this, but enchantment and illusion routinely fall into what we call the save or suck phenomenon. What does that mean, Brother Mutant? Well, let me tell you, class. If you make your save, nothing happens. That's the point. So if they roll a nat 20, that's 5% of the time minimum, because that can always happen. Remember, 1d20, that's uh, one, out of five, uh, 1 out of 20 chances that it'll happen. That's a nat uh, 20, that's 5% of the time minimum that they will literally be like, no, it didn't, didn't work on me. And that shit sucks, because if that's your cup of tea, like if that's all you do, you're the enchantress of the fucking party. Like you went heavy sorceress build, went heavy on enchantment, because that's your thing, that's your jam, right? I'm in charge of everybody because they're all my little meat puppets or whatever is your fucking mentality on why you're the enchanter. And it fails? What the fuck good are you? So it, it's real easy to fall down that rabbit hole of, my character sucks. No, it doesn't. It's just enchantment can be horrible. Illusion can be horrible. Again, think about in, in terms of uh, uh, any of these other spells, uh, uh, schools, evocation will take evocation as a stable what happens when they pass their check on that routinely they take half damage still yes there's those little ninja bastards when they do the reflex check thanks to was it evasion and improved evasion that they can take like no damage or half damage or something like that and just fuck you completely and again would you say the evoker's bad at his job fuck no why because he'll set your face on fire motherfucker so why don't you why do you give him a break because you can visually see he's doing damage. He's putting out numbers. That's the goal. You see the enchanter. When you get a good enchantment build, an illusion too. Let's let's go back to illusion. That phantasmal killer. I can fucking drop anybody that's not immune to illusion or mind affecting spells because that's usually what they fall under that category. And if I can penetrate their spell resistance, if they have any, and I have enough of a spell focus and greater spell focus and racial bonus from being a gnome for illusion magic, which is a thing. I can fucking make really good illusions to the point where, like, that big-ass barbarian over there that would fucking terrorize and kill my ass with, like, one swing. I can drop him like a stone because I cast one spell on him. And all I have to worry about is that nat 20. Think about that. 5% of the time, I'm going to be ineffectual. Yeah, that sucks. But 95% of the time, if that's the goal, I mean, you have to really build into that high uh, DC check. The goal is, to me, when I make a DC check build, like an Eldritch Sign that's an Arcane Bloodline, which has a... a school power ability where you get to pick any school of magic and get a plus two to its DC check forevermore. That shows up at level like 15, but still, I can totally do that and, and get other buffs besides. I have made an illusionist build with that with meta magic besides, and I was able to push it to where I was getting like a plus four, plus five, plus six to the DC check by the end of the build and I could take that two higher and get it up to a plus eight. So where, the again, the goal was, so long as I penetrated their spell resistance, which wasn't a big thing in Keymaker, 5% of the time my spell would fail because they would roll that nat 20. And when those days happen, hey, that day sucks. But 95% of the time, it works every time. It was the catchphrase, right? So 
like if Phantasmal Killer doesn't impress you, know there's an AOE version for the Wizard and Sorcerers that can do that illusion spell. And it's like I said, it's it's Phantasmal Killer, but AOE style. So it's mass. It's not called that. It's like mass Phantasmal Killer. And it literally is just AOE, like dudes are like ninjas or samurais are popping up everywhere and just like, you know, chopping them down once and everyone just dies. It's fucking amazing. If you have, again, if you, if you build for it, they will die. This is what I can tell you. Same with enchantment. If you build for it, and again, assuming a lot, there's a lot of assumptions going on here. You, you can penetrate their spell resistance, that they're not immune to mind effects, because guess what? Enchantments, by and large, not all. But like, again, 99.9% .9 of the time, if it's an attack enchantment spell, it's probably flagged under the spell descriptor as mind affecting. There's lots of things that are uh, immune to mind effects. There's spells that you can't hit them with enchantment, like whole person. That don't work on a dog. It ain't a person. It don't work on monsters. Cut it ain't the whole monster spell. There's a whole animal spell. There's a whole monster spell. There's a whole person spell. Person means humanoids. And undead don't fall in any of those three categories. Well, maybe they fall in a monster. I take that back. But again, routinely, you'll find your enchantment spells don't do shit against undead. So when you want to take out, like, a, a, it's like our, our old running joke with us on you know, D&D, &D, when me and my friends used to play uh, pen and paper, you get uh, an enchantress that, and, and I say enchantress because usually the enchantress was always the, you know, the woman in gold, you know, blonde hair, big titties, just, you know, wearing silk robes and everywhere, just, you know, like she was super fancy. That was the enchantress. She was all about being pretty and everyone kissing her ass. That's why she was the enchantress, whether she was or not. Didn't have to be, but the point was that was how we always envisioned them in our head. So when we fought like the the king's wife, who was the enchantress bitch, who was trying to take over the kingdom, routinely we just sent like undead armies against the bitch because why? Her enchantment spells didn't work against them. She would control the guard and make the guard attack them, and hey, that's still low value. But by and large, when she was trapped in a corner by herself, their spells didn't do fuck all against that skeleton army coming to eat her face off. So again. Know your strengths, know your weaknesses is basically the take-home message here on a lot of this shit. Now, we've talked about that. Let's talk about spell specialization. What does this lame duck sauce do? Spell specialization is a weird one. This is one that you already have to have spell focus in any school, doesn't matter. From there, any spell you or any one spell you cast that falls under that school, you can pick a spell that is your specialty spell, so to speak. And it gets plus two to its caster level for all variables for that spell. So if it's like a one minute per caster level and you're level 10, but you have spell specialization in that spell, it's level 12 to you. So if, it, if it's one minute per caster level instead of being 10 minutes, it's 12 minutes. You can see the appeal. If it's an evocation spell, it's a fine example. Fireball, let's say you're level eight, but you have spell specialization in Fireball, and you cast that spell instead of it doing 8d6 of damage, it goes up to its maximum, which is 10d6, because you can have two caster levels tacked on top of it. It doesn't push it beyond it. So after that, once you get to level 9 and 10, it becomes less valuable. At level 9, it only still goes up to 10 because that's where it caps out. At level 10, it's completely useless to pick Fireball again. Well, that's when you pick something different. So at least when you pick this feat, at every level you get a new spell choice to pick. So if you've, you pick the wrong one, you're like, oh, I picked Fireball and I wanted Lightning Bolt. Ah, oh, fuck. Well, next level when you level up, you can switch it. So there is that. Know that that's a thing. However, the downside of this is, uh, for spell specialization, uh, unless they've changed it, I still maintain this This is true. If you had two spell foci, like say you had uh, evocation and uh, necromancy, for whatever fucking reason, you can pick spell specialization, but you don't get one for each. It just opens up the list of both. So all your necromancy spells that you have access to, you could pick one, and all your evocation spells that you have access to will be also on that list. You can only pick one. So we can flip-flop, if you will. Like, I pick evocation on this level, level 7. Let's say I'm evocation, spell specialization, and fireball. And at level 10, since fireball is useless, maybe I want to do a necromancy spell that I want to last longer, like a, my create undead spell. It'll last two rounds longer. Ooh, ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. But you'd be surprised at how many spells that you'll flip-flop between. So again, know what your caps are. Know what benefit spell specialization gives you. Because once you get, like I said, to level 10, fireball spell specialization is useless. Because you're already at 10d6 of damage. You, you don't get better, you're, you're stuck. And you just wasted your pick for spell specialization. And you will routinely do this. And sometimes, and I hate to say this, sometimes there is dead zones where when I get to a certain level, let's say like level 11, there is no spell I can pick. I'm using this as an example. I don't have an actual number in my head. There is no spell that I can pick from my spell focus that would benefit from it. 
when that's the case, just pick something and move on. Don't fucking waste your time thinking about it. Just be like, oh, shit, I'm boned. All right, I'm picking that. Because it doesn't help you at all, and you're, and you're wasting your time deciding. Because there's no decision. If, there, if really nothing benefits from it, just pick something and move on. The next level, suddenly you'll have something you'll have access to, probably. You, or you'll remember, hopefully, to pick a spell that would benefit from it. Remember, you will get upgrades as you level up. But spell specialization is still one of those where I can't ever seem to make myself like it. The only possible exception to this one, to me... <sighs> Let's think about this. Because this would take you beyond caster level 20, by the way. So you'd be caster level 22, technically speaking, with this for that one and only spell. If you had that spell, it'd be 22... Uh, let's say rounds. So it's like one round per caster level. That'd be 22. If you could double that with extend meta magic, that'd be 44. That still wouldn't be enough. No, I was I was thinking maybe you could get it to be a five minute buff. Because if you could, then you have enduring spells and greater enduring spells. Something that you get from your mythic path that could take you up and over to where it's a like 24 hour buff. Won't work though. Okay, so there's not that. There's exceptions to the rule. Always exceptions to the rule. like if I was a lich mythic path, I could get over caster level 20. Remember, same with uh, if I was a, a cleric. And I was an angel mythic path, I could get over level 20 cleric. So again, there's exceptions to every rule here. But for the most part, I would say spell specialization, you'd probably only really want to grab this if you had spell focus evocation. Why do I say that? Because most of your evocation spells are tied to your caster level, and it's usually damage. So again, our aforementioned fireball spell. Before your level 10, wouldn't you like it to do? Two uh, d6 more of damage. I know I would. So again, if you're level, because again, you can pick this up real fucking early. All you need is spell focus. See that up there? Hey, come back here. See the spell focus up there? You can have spell focus at level one because of uh, this pick here, and then at level three, I could have spell specialization uh, and pick a, a evocation spell. So think about that. I could have a, a, a burning hand, which does three d6 of damage at level three for everyone else because I have spell specialization in it. I could do 5d6 of damage, which would be where it caps out, or 5d4, excuse me. I want to get to level 2 spells, which is right here at level 3. Instead of getting Burning Hands, I could grab, say, Burning Arc. That does 1d6 of fire damage to the first target. Maximum is 10d6. Well, again, I'm only doing 3d6. Well, not for me. I'm spell specialization in Burning Arc, maybe. So now that evocation spell for me, at that low level, is doing 5d6 of damage. That's impressive. And it will bounce through multiple bad guys because of that caster level increase. And it will do less damage, but it's still more damage than it would be for without spell specialization. And again, like I said, most of these fall into the evocation. Not all, but most of these fall into the evocation spell uh, category that do that extra damage. And you'd appreciate it, I'd say. Now, last thing to talk about, and this is why this part of the video is going to be long, is meta magics because there's a lot to explain here. First, the biggie is, uh, notice that... Uh, these are just available to us as a wizard. It doesn't work that way for every class, I don't think. Some of them have like re restrictions or something, like you don't have access to them until later. I could be wrong on that. But uh, what is the various meta magic? Again, we have meta magic for all these empower, extend, heighten, maximize, persistent, quick, and reach, and selective. What, first, what do they do? Before we do that, what is the real concern here? Because all these sound awesome. Why wouldn't I want all of them, Brother Mutant? Because, well, one, that's like eight or nine or 12 different fucking things to pick. And you ain't got that much room, really, let's be honest. And two, it requires you change the spell. Metamagics make you upgrade, if you will, the spell. Let's take an example. Here's Empower uh, Metamagic. It, notice, has a level increase. All of them do. Uh, the only one exception to the rule is heighten. And you get to set how high you heighten it. I'll explain that last because that's a very difficult concept. But this one, it tells you with the, the pick of the feet, it's plus two, which means a level one spell, it now becomes a level three spell if I empower it. There's exceptions to the rule of ways to work around that, but by and large, that's how it works. It goes two spell slots higher. Well, what does it give you for that two spell slots higher? 50% more. What, damage? Probably. Duration? In some cases. Not all. Why? Because what Empower does is if it, if the spell has a variable in it, like a 10d6 fireball damage, that's a variable. It could be 10, it could be 60, it could be somewhere in between. That's a die roll. If you ever see a die roll and you can Empower it, so again, glitches happen sometimes that devs have decided that you can't um, Empower a spell even though you clearly see a die roll. You're like, what the fuck, dude? There's a die roll. I see it in the descriptor. They still won't let you Empower it. 
So either submit it as a bug report or just realize that not every spell is going to get this. So again, this is another one of those where you have to test a lot of shit. And I have done that in the past for Kingmaker. And I so if I'm using outdated information, I apologize. And it does happen. I'm like, oh, this won't work for the power, or this won't work for like an extend is a fine example where it doubles the duration of the spell. So if it has any duration, one round, ten rounds, an hour, five years, whatever, you can double it. It costs one spell slot more. So level one spell becomes level two, two become three. You get the idea. This did not in Kingmaker used to work, in, at least in the last time I checked it, for Vampire Touch. Remember, Vampire Touch does damage, but it also does more than that. It heals you, or gives you 10 HP, I should say, for one hour. That's a duration, damn it. I want it to be two. I know it won't last for two, because again, it's 10 HP. These fall off faster than anything, but it's not the fucking point. I wanted it. I invested in it. I should get my fucking duration. They did not let you do it. You couldn't even make an extended version of Vampire Touch. So, that sucks. So again, know your spells. But again, in this game, I believe I saw the other day that it actually did work. And I was like, completely confounded with it. I'm like, oh fuck, I've been lying to you guys all this time. No, it still doesn't work on Kingmaker. So they changed their mind. But know that shit, for one thing. The other uh, is the level increase depends on the meta magic and no you can apply more than one meta magic to a spell if you want to extend and empower a spell if it can do both uh, like that vampire touch like i want it to last two hours but i also want it to do 50 percent more damage and 50 percent more temp hp to me you could extend and empower and again they're additive so this one gives you a plus one to the spell level remember vampiric touch for those who don't know is level three spell so now it'd be level four if i empowered that same spell the one that i extended Level 4 now becomes level 6, because again, 2 levels higher. So that's pricey, but maybe you want that. I can't tell you not to make it. So the point's still the same. Know that this is going to really jack up how many spells um, you cast at the higher level that are going to be these various versions. And again, the decision on you to decide is my empowered fireball spell. Remember, that's a level 3 spell. Is an empowered fireball spell. It does 50% more damage, so now it's technically, I know it's not true, but it's a good enough way to think about it. Is it now it does 15d6 of damage. That's a level 5 spell now. Isn't is there another level 5 spell that could have done the same or better damage? That's still fire? Maybe. And if that's the case, then why the hell did you empower that fireball spell? See the point? If you had access to him, of course. So that's the thing you have to decide, things you look for. But my advice to you when you get any meta magic. Slot every fucking spell you can with that meta magic. Why? Just because you have it in your spell book doesn't mean you have to use it. But now you have the option. This is why I make myself like the Batman, the MacGyver of the, the wizarding world. is because I have like one or two or sometimes even three meta magics. And I will have a spell book that may sound like it's small because I'm an older scion. I don't have many spell castings a day and I don't have many spell picks to pick from because I'm a spontaneous caster. Much like a sorcerer. However... I have like a tool for every fucking occasion. If I need electric damage at level 2, there is no electric damage for level 2. Well, what if I reach? It's a plus 1 to the spell. Something like Shocking Grass. That's a level 1 spell. Now I can shoot it at a distance, a short distance, close range, because of the reach meta magic, and now it's a level 2 casting. So now I have electric spells at level 1 and 2 now. See that? So that's why I use meta magics for. So no what uh, the effect is, which we'll talk about here in a minute, but know, of course, more importantly, how high this, the level increase of the spell is. Because Empower is good, that's a plus two. Extend is great, it's a plus one. Reach is great in many cases, it's also a plus one. So again, some really good uses out of some of these low ones. These are the three, by, I, I point these out because these are the three I routinely take on an Elder Scion. Why? Because Elder Scions can only cast up to level six. So I cannot empower, extend, or reach any of those level 6 spells because there's no 7, 8, or 9 casting for me. There's exceptions to the rule, like always, but by and large, that's why I keep it to the low ones. Better than those? Maximize. Just like it sounds, it's 3 levels higher. So that fireball, that 10d6 fireball spell at level 3, if you maximize it, it's now level 6. That's a big oof. However, what did it do? It did full damage. Guaranteed. Now, of course, there's still the reflex saving throw and blah, blah, blah. Having the damage or taking the damage to zero, even, for that matter. But 60 damage guaranteed, that's impressive. But wasn't there probably a better spell for you to cast at level 6? That, you know, yeah, it could roll less than 60, but it has a chance to roll way better than 60 as well. So that's where, again, I can't tell you what to do. I just know me. When it comes to stuff like this, know that all of these meta metamagic uh, choices, with the exception of maybe persistent or selective, because they're new, even heightened for that matter um 
there's a metamagic rod equivalent in the game. For example, I can find a metamagic empower rod that would allow me three times a day to just activate the rod, cast my spell, a normal level one spell, and I empower it. Take that shocking wrath that does 5d6 of damage, I can do 50% more damage to that spell with that rod. It's still a level one casting, but I can only do it three times a day. So find those rods is my advice to you. But there's still plenty of reason to want to grab these things. Just to walk through the list, this is a plus two. Extend is plus one. My game's getting overheated already. Come on. Plus one. Heighten is variable. We'll talk about that at the end, like I said. But again, make make sure you understand that could be plus one all the way up to goddamn plus nine. If you're plus eight, I should say, if you wanted to. Again, for a wizard, that makes sense because they have access to level one through nine spells. Same with the sorcerer, same with an oracle, same with a cleric, druid, you get the idea. For me, the typical Magus build that I go with, especially an Eldritch Scion, all of them cap out at level six spells. So I can heighten the level one spell all the way up to level six. So again, we'll talk about what it does, and then we'll talk about why you would scale it from one to six or one to two, one to whatever. But again, it's variable. It's the only one on this list that is variable. Maximize is plus three. It's a big oof, but sometimes, man, you just really want to do full fucking damage. Blood Rager, ugh, it's, it kills me not to have a Blood Rager that can Blood Rage a Fireball spell. Remember, they can cast spells level 1, 2, 3, and 4. That's it. So that Fireball spell level 3, if they maximize it or try to, that's a level 6 casting, son. They don't cast that high. They don't even cast this high. So this is the problem. But again, maximize is awesome. Persistent, this is a new one. This didn't exist in Kingmaker, I believe. They added this with um, mods. So, and same with uh, Selective, by the way. Uh, so, Modders added even more than this. That's where we got the, the Metamagic Intensified, the one that's missing from my list here. And then there's Metamagic Rhyme, where any cold-damaging spells could slow the target. It's an amazing upgrade. Again, Modders are going to make the game so much better. But we work with what we got. Persistent is basically um, Disadvantage. So, if you have a spell that has a saving throw, you throw it out at the bad guy for two spell slots higher. You take that Fireball spell, level three, is now level 5. Still the same damage. Nothing's changed. However, because it's persistent, they roll a saving throw check. And again, if they pass it, they roll another check. And if they fail it, now they fail it. So again, all, uh, it's disadvantage. It's it's the, you roll twice, you take the worst of the two. If you fail it on the first one, it doesn't matter that you roll it twice. So They don't make you roll it twice, I think. But if you pass it, they'll make you roll again. That's nice. And now again, Think about persistent for all those illusion and enchantment spells. Remember we said we don't like failing, and they, they roll that nat 20. 5% of the time, you're getting bone, son. What if you persist that spell? Yeah, it's a pricey two-level increase. That's a, that's a real big price to fucking pay for that spell, but that's disadvantage on the roll. What's the chance you're going to roll 20 back-to-back? -back? Well, remember, you roll it once, that's a 5% chance. What's the chance you roll a 20 and then follow up with another 20? I don't know the math on it, but it's a 5% of a 5%, and that's a lot less than 5%. I want to say it's like 1.25 or even lower than that so it's unlikely is the point it'll happen and man when it does it'll fucking piss you off but this would be what you would put on those builds where uh, on a build where you have save or suck spells and they have to land or you get boned persistent spell matters and again the fact that it wasn't in kingmaker really sucked because that would be a, a meta magic that i could get behind and it's not that much of an increase. Two levels, hey, that sucks. But even on something like a bar that can get to level six spells, or my Magus that can get to level six spells, you can still see the use of this spell. There's plenty of level four spells and on down that I still want to hit, and that I still want them to land, because Hideous Laughter is amazing, uh, Color Spray is amazing, uh, Fireball, of course, Lightning Bolt. There's a lot of good spells that are level four on down, so don't kid yourself. Being able to jump it up two levels, hey, that sucks, but... If it means it works, then again, the difference between our team is alive, or in the dirt. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So persistence is good. Quicken. This is the biggie. This is the one that I would never take on a subcaster. Remember, that's someone that can cast level 6 spells or lower. There's reasons to get this in a metamagic rod, though, for what it does. But this is a plus 4 caster level, or spell level increase, excuse me. So a level 1 spell becomes level 5. For what it does, it's awesome. But fucking level five? Fuck you, man. This would be the one that if, if, and I mean, it's a big if, if I grab it, it's on like a wizard or an oracle or a sorcerer, someone that can get to level nine spells. Because again, you could quicken a level five spell. Those are good spells. It's level three. There's some good spells in there, but to quicken it, it's now level seven or eight or nine. That's a big oof. But sometimes you just need it. 
And again, there's ways around it always. But it's a good one. It's pricey. Reach, only a plus one. Again, can't say enough good things about it. Same with Extend, which is only a plus one. Same with Empower, which is a plus two. Those are my go-to. And that makes my spell book really diversified. Selective, another one that's new, wasn't in Kingmaker. It's also only a plus one, so I have yet to really invest in this. Notice how this one does have a prerequisite. You need Spellcraft rank 10, which I don't know exists in this game. I would assume for Spellcraft they mean probably uh, knowledge, um, not magic, what the fuck's it called? Arcana, knowledge arcana 10 would be how I'd probably see this. Or at least caster level 10, something like that. But that doesn't exist in this game right here. The Spellcraft 10, that doesn't exist. So I'm assuming there is an exception to the rule. And you may say, well, then how can you have access to it? I have access to everything, Sunshine. Uh, that's why you see I have Greater Elemental Focus. See how everything's red up there? I have a mod that I've, I've unlocked every feat. So that's why. So again, I, I would assume uh, that uh, Metamagic Selective has a restriction on it of some kind that we're just not seeing. Notice a plus one level increase. So level one becomes two, five becomes six. You get the idea. When you cast a selected spell, it's but we're talking an AOE spell that's not teammate friendly. We have the ability using our ability score modifier. So if you're a wizard or your intelligence, if you're a bard, oracle, paladin, blah, 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 you're a charisma more likely than not. Eldritch Scion, charisma, other magi, intelligence, wisdom for your obvious um, divine caster types. There's, of course, an intelligent... Uh, Intelligence-based sorcerer. There's a wisdom-based sorcerer even in the game, which is fucking awesome. So again, there's some serious fun to be had here. But so this is just generalization that they're giving you here, by the way. But the point is, whatever your casting stat, say it that way, whatever your casting stat is, you can use that the bonus from your casting stat to exclude that many people. So if I have a, a, an intelligence of let's say 18, that's a plus four bonus for my intelligence, right? I cast a selective spell. I can select up to four targets, like me and, and three of my teammates, so that don't get hurt by the spell. Basically, that's why it's selective. I'm selecting that it don't hurt you guys. So this is, again, for what it costs, that's not bad. Think about those fireball spells, level three to level four. I know I'd rather have a fireball spell that doesn't hurt like my team. So here you go. Well, the downside is there is a fireball spell in the game that won't hurt your team. It's called Controlled Fireball. That's amazing. But it's the only spell in the game that's like that, where it's damaging spell, and it should be damaging your team, but it won't. That includes you. You can cast that shit, spam it at your feet. It won't hurt you one fucking bit. But for like Lightning Bolt, there is no Lightning Bolt that's controlled Lightning Bolt. But if you made it selective, level 3 Lightning Bolt goes to level 4. I can shoot down a narrow corridor. My team's all running this way. I use Selective Spell, and in theory, I haven't used it yet. In theory, I can make most, if not all, of my team immune to it with a high enough caster stat. But still hear all the bad guys that are chasing them down the fucking hallway. That's what Selective Spell is for amazing upgrade as you can see and again for what it costs it's not that bad this might be another one that makes my list because i routinely throw out fireball lightning bolt dragon's breath just, ah, damage and i don't give no fuck whether the team lives i'll just say it you guys are here to serve me not the other way around if i die the fight's over we're done so fuck you <laughs> selective spell is important so could make the cut, is my point. Now, again, what do these things do? Again, 50% increase. Now, again, normally damage. Doesn't have to be. There's examples of, of spells that... the uh, Mirror Image is a fine example of an Empower spell. Now, later on, an Empowered Mirror Image is just Mirror Image. But early levels, Mirror Image is a die roll to see how many images appear around you. The maximum is eight. So it's what's you in the center, and then, well, wherever. You're so, not supposed to be in the center. But... That's the way it looks in the game. You're in the center, and then there's one in front of you, one behind you, one to the left and right of you, and then diagonals to the front diagonal, left and right, behind you, diagonal, left and right. So there's eight images around you. They're supposed to each represent you. Remember, that's how it works. Otherwise, if it was always you in the center, every fighter on the team would say, shoot the guy in the center, because, you know, duh. But the idea is that you're, you're swimming around with all these images, and no one really knows which one is you and which one is the illusions. But there's a die roll, is my point, and that die roll is random. So early levels, you can only get a couple. You may get all eight. Maybe not at the earliest levels, but you can get close to having the eight all around you, the maximum. If you empower it, which you can do, you get 50% more illusions, again, up to the maximum of eight. So you can just get to the maximum sooner, is what I'm telling you. But you can empower it, and it has nothing to do with damage, but there is a die roll. Now, for the ones that have a duration... Remember, the duration rarely is a die roll. There's exceptions to the rule. 
But if there isn't a die roll, if it's just one round per caster level, Empower doesn't do shit for that. That doesn't mean it doesn't affect the spell. If the spell did damage, like Sirocco does damage per round, it does one round per caster level. Empower, you can empower a Sirocco because there's a die roll. It will not last longer because you empowered it. It will just do more damage. If you extend it, there's one right here. Extend doubles whatever the duration is. Is it one round? It's now two. Is it one minute? It's two minutes. Is it an hour? Two hours. Is it one round per caster level? Now it's technically two rounds per caster level. You get the idea. And this is why I like extend. Extend was my buff bot uh, upgrade. This was the way I would take my wizard, my sorcerer, my elder scion, whoever, my cleric, whatever. Whoever I buffed with, with spells, extend was the go-to. Why? Because double duration, baby. Who doesn't want shit to last longer? Well, this dungeon's big. Well, I got a buff that lasts for five minutes. Wouldn't you rather it last for ten? I know I would. You see what I'm saying? And it doesn't cost much. It's a plus one caster level increase. So a level one spell becoming level two, I can fucking make that sacrifice sometimes. So I will routinely do extend. We'll do heighten at the end. Maximize. Again, has to be a die roll. There has to be a variable. So maximize and empower routinely get compared to each other. So let's have this argument right now. For uh, sakes of, of, of keeping you from beating your head against the wall. Okay, guys, I'm leaning back in my chair, so I apologize if I'm quiet now. But maximize takes whatever the variable is and maxes it. So if it's 1d6 of damage, it's 6 now. That's why I have 10 D6 fireball. There's 10 die rolls there, right? 10 dice, all 1 D6. And again, you can roll 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. Well, if it's maximized, it's all 6s. So it's 10 times 6 now. That's why it's 60 damage. Fucking awesome. Well, what does Empowered do? It takes that 10 D6 and makes it 50% stronger. I say 15 D6. That doesn't mean there's 15 new die rolls. Not, it's not 15 now, but think about it. If you roll all ones, so you roll basically a 10 on that fireball spell, then it multiplies it by 1.5. That's what Empower does. And now you did 15. That's why I say 15d6, just because it helps keep the math straight in my head a little bit better. The way this breaks down is when you have those spells where it's like a, a weird number, like an odd number, there is no, you know, like 1d6 if I empower it. There's no 1.5d6, right? So that's where it falls apart. But... Just know, it, whatever the die roll is, it multiplies it by 1.5, rounded down. So if you roll a 1, sorry, you still get a 1. If you roll a 2, suddenly it's a 3. If you roll a 3, it's it's 4, it's better, but it's not a 4.5. Right? So that's how Empower is different. But the reason I bring this up is because while Maximize is 3 spell slots, remember a Fireball spell level 3 becomes level 6 if you Maximize it. If you Empower it, level 3 becomes level 5, because it's only 2, and, and here's where people will argue which is better. Routinely, if we're talking meta magic now, there's what I'm looking at right now on the screen, meta magic, empowered on the forums and, and pen and paper, and I trust these guys, people will swear that empower is technically better than maximize. Could you roll worse? Sure. If I rolled, like again, all 10s on that fireball spell, it's only doing 15 damage. If I have maximized it, it's guaranteed 60. That's way better than 15. What the fuck are you doing to me, dude? Yeah, but remember, it costs you a level 6 spell slot versus a level 5. It's less precious, right? Those level 6 spell slots, those are fucking money. So level 5, it sucks. And hey, man, I feel it when you roll all 10 or all 1s like that. It sucks ass. But again, what happens if you rolled all 6s? Because that was a thing, too. And you empowered it. A, it's a level spell slot slower. And it did more damage than the maximize. Why? Because what is 60 damage times 1.5? 90. So you can see how Empower could technically do more damage, the same damage, or obviously less damage than maximize. Maximize is a set number. You know what you're getting. But it's pricey. That's why the people will swear by Empower. Now, that's if I have to upgrade it myself. Be real clear on this. Remember we talked about those meta magic rods that are in the game? There's one for Empower. There's one for Maximize too. If that's your choice, fucking maximize all day, every day, baby, because it didn't cost you anything, just the use of that rod. Fuck yeah. And, let's just be honest, if you could do both, which can happen, you can maximize and empower a fireball spell with a metamagic rod. So let's say I take my fireball spell level 3, let's say I have metamagic and power, and I made it level 5. And before I cast it, I turn on my metamagic rod for maximize. 
three times a day I can make that fireball spell, that max or empowered fireball spell, be full damage. Now what does that mean? It it factors in both of those meta magics. I get full damage, that's sixty. Assuming that I'm casting at caster level 10 and higher, which of course I would be. I'm doing 60 damage, but then Empower kicks in and does 50% more of 60. It's 90 damage now. And again, it cost me a level 5 spell slot, but it's guaranteed 90 damage now. And I can do that, let's say, three times a day. See how impressive that is? So there's reasons to combine. You just need to know the tricks. But again, if if you're upgrading it yourself in your spellbook using these meta magics, Empowered most often is your go-to versus maximize. Even if you're a sorcerer or wizard where you have access to level 9 spells, sometimes it's nice to have that shit guaranteed to be maximum, but it's it's routinely going to be that Empower would have been equal to or better than it, and it costs less. And that's the selling point. Okay, Persistent. Again, we already talked about this, but just to rehash the fact that it's basically disadvantage. As long as there's a saving throw, it's a two-spell slot increase to cast it, but they basically roll twice. Well, first, let me say it. That's not true. They roll once. If they pass it, they roll again. If they fail it, then they fail. If they fail it on the first roll, there is no second roll. Okay, just so we're clear. It's not like it, they roll twice guaranteed and they take the worst of the two. That would be ideal, but it was probably too hard to code, I would assume, that way. So they just said, fuck it. If you pass the check, then they re-roll it. It's very similar to the way they do blind fight in this game, where uh, if there's concealment and I have the, the feat called blind fight, and I swing and I miss, I re-roll it. That's what Blind Fight does for me. If I swing and I hit, it doesn't re-roll it because there's no need. I passed already. See that? So it's the same principle here. So they just made it simple on themselves. And I'm cool with that. Quicken. So now this one is weird. Let's talk about it. Quicken. All it does for a very pricey four-level increase to the spell means you can cast it as a swift action. For those of you that don't know, you get one swift action around. Especially noticeable when you do turn-based combat. Swift action means that I can, if I quicken the spell first, this is key, if you want to cast two spells in the same round, you quicken one, cast it first. It will use your swift action. Then, follow it up with any other spell. And there is no limit to your next spell, as far as I know. Uh, notice, um, it won't do you any good on a spell that takes... Um, a full round to cast. You cannot quicken it. I think that's a lie, though, because I think you can quicken spells that have a full round. Like um, an example of a full round casting spell, reduced person and large person, I believe those can be quickened. And it shouldn't be, because of what the tooltip says. Normally, though, it says you can't. So that may change. So again, we're in beta. But having said that, why quicken? Again, quicken is amazing for two reasons. One, you can obviously cast a spell faster, which means you can cast it with another spell right behind it. Action economy, if you want to think of it that way. The other reason is, notice how it says right there in the tool, that casting a quickened spell doesn't provoke an attack of opportunity. If you're casting a spell, you're a wizard, let's say, and you're up in the back ranks, but someone fucking charged your ass, and he's back there ready to punch you in the face for trying to cast a spell, you have to fucking figure out how to GTFO or risk getting punched in the face to cast a spell. Well, not if you quicken it. Because quicken is fast. It's I cast the spell. Poof. You know, I teleport, I hit you with fireball, I buff myself with mirror image. Whatever the fucking spell is, it's quick and boop. And that means no attack of opportunity. So that's money right there. That alone is the reason you want to quicken stuff. Again, it's pricey, so it's it's one of those things you're just not likely to do. Good news is there's quicken meta magic rods in the game. So again, three times a day, you can just turn on Mr. Rod and boop, I have mage armor on because I got jumped in the forest. This is an example of why you would want quicken in my opinion, to self-buff or to, to debuff the bad guys, you know, control them quickly because the team's not ready yet kind of shit. Like, oh, fuck. Well, what are we going to do? Help a jeebus. Help a jeebus. So you, you hit them with an entangle spell, a web spell, a grease spell, or whatever you can do. Whatever makes sense at the time. So Quicken is amazing, but it's real pricey for what it does. Reach is simple. It's great. It's only a plus one caster level, or spell slot level, excuse me, to cast it. What does Reach do? First, let's tell you what it doesn't do. Any spell that has a, a distance, a, a range, if you will, of personal, which means like a, think of a shield spell. You can only cast it on yourself. You can't reach it because the range is you. You can't double the range. There's just you, right? But if it's the range of touch, that's different. Range of touch can be shot at a distance now. So how it works is the range of touch becomes short range. 
a short range spell that you reach would become medium medium becomes long long does not benefit from reach that there's a very few spells that are are long range i'll give you an example acid arrow one of the best spells in the game in my opinion because of its range being long as shit damage but there's no spell resistance as long as i can hit you with it and you're not immune to acid i'm probably going to do some damage to you it's a great fuck you spell but you cannot reach it because it's already at the max range having said that what else can't you reach you can't reach aoe spells if they're already uh at long range you also can't reach uh, cone spells so like dragon's breath shout greater shout things of this nature you can't reach them because it doesn't increase the length of the cone fireball is not i believe at long range is at medium i believe so you could in theory reach that one the the, the bigger circle is all you're going to get for where you can place it so that should always be a thing same with like grease spell web spell the ones that are already at full range it ain't going to do you a fucking bit of good but that's reach and that's why i like it that's why I like Reach, that's why I like Extend, and that's why I like Empower. They're cheap, and they give me a lot of utility. Many spells can be reached. The ones that can't usually have a duration. I can extend them. If they can't do either of those, usually there's a die roll in there for damage. Think about Extend, right? You can't extend a Fireball spell. Why? There's no duration. The, da the duration is instantaneous. You may not be able to reach it if it's already at long range, like a li Lightning Bolt. Like Again, it's a, a narrow cone, so to speak. You can't reach Lightning Bolt. You can't extend Lightning Bolt, but I can empower it. So if it doesn't fall within those three categories, it's probably a very weird spell. Last one, again, Selective. We already talked about it. Well, I'm sorry, second to last. Last one is Heighten. Let's talk about this one, because this will be the end of the video. Heighten. <sighs> Heighten is the only one that's variable. When you set the spell, you set the level of the spell slot. So it can be plus one spell slot, plus two, plus eight. Your choice. Now, of course, I can't cast beyond level 6 if I'm a, a magus. If I'm a wizard like I am right now, again, I can get to level 9, so I can make a level 1 spell a level 9 spell. Why would I do that? What does Heighten do? Heighten increases the DC check of the spell. Remember how DC checks of spells work. So the saving throw of a spell... Give me a chance to pop this up. The saving throw of a spell is based on a variety of things. One, base is 10. Always. With the, with the saving throw of a spell, there's always a base 10. Then you throw in the level of the spell. So a level 1 spell has a DC of 10 plus 1, so that's 11. Plus any modifiers. Now that's your, your casting stat modifier, your high intelligence or wisdom or charisma, for example. Your spell focus, greater spell focus. Do you have um, uh, elemental focus, greater elemental focus? Is any of that shit applicable? Do you have gear on you that busts all your mind affecting spells? Do you have stuff that affects all your fear spells? That shit's all taken into account. But just generically, it's the base 10, the level of the spell, and your spell casting stat. My high intelligence. So a level 1 spell, let's say I have an intelligence of, of 18, that's a plus 4. A level 1 spell for me would be 10 plus 1 plus 4. That's 15. If I heighten it to level 2, it would be 10 plus 2 plus 4. And you may say, well, what about all these other fuckers? I got an empowered spell. It's level one snowball spell that has a saving throw. And I empower it to do more damage. It has a saving throw. It's a level three spell now, right? No. It's a level three casting. All these other metamagics do not affect the DC check. So if you take that fireball spell and you maximize it, remember level three going to level six, that's 60 damage, right? The DC check is still based on it being a level three spell. You understand? So I should have probably led with that. That's very important. The DC check doesn't change because you empowered it, you extend it, you maximize it. There's exceptions to the rule. That's another reason why I like the Arcane Bloodline, but that's for another time. Point is, for everyone else, all you newbies, know that you are not upgrading the DC check. You're just upgrading the duration, the damage, the whatever, right? Because that's what they do. Heighten is the only one, and I used to routinely in Kingmaker, I would say this wrong. I'd be like, this is a stupid spell upgrade. No, it wasn't. I just didn't understand what Heighten did. So if you want a higher DC check, like maybe that, that color spray spell, it's a level 1 illusion cone spell, and it's good from level 1 all the way to level 20 if it works, but it's a low DC check, so it's unlikely to work. Well, maybe I want to cast it at level 6. That's a 5-point increase to the DC of that spell, because at level 1, it's 10 plus 1 plus whatever. This would be 10 plus 6 plus whatever. You can see the appeal. If it'll work, and all I needed to do is to work to do what I need, 
Heighten is your go-to. And this one has real uh, versatility to your build, especially as a spontaneous caster. Wizards, sure. Uh, clerics and druids, sure. But oracle or oracles, um, sorcerers, eldritch scions, the, the spontaneous casters, remember we have limited picks. Wouldn't you like to have a snowball spell at level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6? Because maybe you just really need to hit the motherfucker with a snowball spell. Doesn't matter if it's level 4, 5, or 6. It'll still do the same damage, but the DC check is there. And maybe that helps. Maybe you don't even care about the DC check. Maybe you just need another fucking cold spell, and this was the only way for you to get it. Heightened spell, baby. That adds so much versatility to your build. So if I were to pick my favorite four now, I would probably have to add Heightened to that list. It's broken, but it's amazingly broken. And it's what Heightened was for. There's no more extra damage. There's no extra anything other than it casts as a higher level, which means the DC check, if there's a DC check, is better. And note that part. So there, like, I could have a Heightened, uh, I think, I can have like a Heightened Mage Armor spell. That does nothing to do with being in level 2 versus level 1. There's no DC check there. It doesn't like cast better because it's level 2 versus level 1. It's a different spell slot. So maybe I ran out of level 1 spells because I had really good spells at level 1 that I wanted. Well, I still want Mage Armor. We'll just heighten it to level 2 and then cast it. Is it wasteful? Sure. But would you rather have it than not have it? Yeah, again, sure. You can see the appeal. So Meta Magic Heighten adds a massive diversity. I still maintain, though, I think that this is limited. So again, grain of salt on that. I haven't played with it a lot. This is the one that literally, when you get every spell in this Wizard Spellbook, or, or Cleric or Druid, because they just give them for free, see which ones you can heighten. Grab this meta magic, only this meta magic. Get a, a cleric or druid or wizard all the way to level 20. Get every spell under their spell book and see which ones you can heighten and write that list down. That's how I do my my picks, by the way. When I do, and I do that because again, for cleric, there's a spontaneous caster that can get their spells. Not all of their spells, but a lot of them, right? Well, what's the spontaneous caster that's like a cleric but not a cleric? That's the oracle, right? There's one for a druid, too. I just can't think of the name of it off the top of my brain. But there's one other one that's a spontaneous caster that's a lot like a druid. But instead of preparing their spells every day, they get a limited list. Same with the wizard and the sorcerer is the counterpart. Again, a spontaneous caster that has access to all the spells. You can't pick them all. But knowing which ones can be heightened, empowered, extended, maximized, etc. and so forth is a big boon to you. Because if you're going to be able to pick one or two of these magics, you probably want to get the one that covers a lot of your bases. Right? That's why when I say I, got, I like Reach, I like Extend, I like Empower. Why? Because if it can't have a better duration, if it can't be shot farther, then it's probably at least can do more damage. So at least one of those three meta magics I can apply. In many cases, two. In a lot of cases, all three. And you may say that seems silly and wasteful and weird. Yes, it definitely is. But think about it. This is a plus one, a plus two, because another plus one. So I'm adding them together. Plus one, now plus two, now plus four. I can take a level 1 spell and make it level 5 even as an Eldritch Scion. That seems wasteful, but again, go back to my original argument. Maybe I have that Snowball spell level 1. I'm out of all my spells level 1, 2, 3, and 4. Maybe I don't have any cold spells at level 5 and 6, but if I've already pre-made a extended, reached, and empowered Snowball spell, it's level 5 now and it's waiting for me in my tray. And if it's the last thing to keep me from dying and killing that bad guy, you better fucking believe I'm casting it. Okay? Now, I know this video's gone on long. I wanted it to be short. This was the small list, by the way. Teamwork feats will probably be a little easier. Uh, that'll probably be the next video I put together. Uh, but after that, we have to get into the very hard ones, which are the combat feats, because there's a lot of them. Maybe even break that into a couple. I'd hate to, because you might tune into one video and say, where's my combat feat that I give a fuck about? And if I'm going in alphabetical order, you may not find it. So I, I probably... Do my best to keep it truncated and maybe not expound so much on the combat one. But there are some really good ones and there's some shit ones in there that I want to steer you away from. And again, not to say that they're bad under every instance. There's going to be exceptions to every rule. But it's like combat casting. I mentioned this before. I'll end with this. There's plenty of reasons to want this. I don't want to cast a spell and have it go nowhere. That's wasteful. But if I'm careful, if my team is careful, if they're keeping the fucking bad guys off me, you don't need this thing. If you've been buffed up, you're protected, you have invisibility, any number of ways where you don't have to worry about them trying to smack you in the face. The downside is what happens when the bad guys start unleashing like fireballs on you and the team. If you took damage, well, you better hope you pass that concentration check or you're going to suck up losing a spell.
it's just a thing. It's something you have to deal with. Notice on that one too, I believe concentration checks, uh, does it tell us? Of course, the game is logging up or slowing down, so it probably won't even pop up. There's a pop-up tooltip for concentration checks, but the concentration check, again, is another 1d20 based on the, I want to say, the damage you take and the level of the spell that you cast. But I think, yeah, there it goes. I think it's uh, also, yeah, your ability score modifier. So the better intelligence you have as a wizard, the easier it is for you to pass the check. The more wisdom you have if you're like a cleric, the easier it is for you to pass the check. You get the idea. So make sure your casting stat's high. I was going to say that I thought constitution helped it, but I must be thinking pen and paper. Uh, point is, though, uh, you will have to pass that check. If you pass that check, the spell casts like normal. Again, that doesn't have anything to do with spell resistance. That has nothing to do with did you hit the target. It's just another roll to see if you were distracted from casting your spell because you got punched in the face or you set your groin on fire or whatever the fuck they did to you. But again, if you're careful and you're planning it right, less likely to be an issue. And in many cases, many classes, that casting classes, will have something like this. Not this, but something like it. A bonus to concentration checks. Just say it that way. It may not be a plus four. It may be a plus two. It may be plus one and then it gets better. As you level up, I have uh, Magus builds do this, where they start where they get like a plus two, then they get a plus three, and then they get a plus four. If you go with the Arcane Bloodline, it's one of the reasons I like the Arcane Bloodline. And yes, before you ask, it stacks with this feat, so feel free to grab it. But it seems silly to go from plus uh, two, three, and four to go to add another four on top of it. Yeah, you're less likely to fail on your spell casting, but eh, you probably weren't going to fail anyway. So again, that's my, my take on the spell quote unquote feat. Remember, uh, last caveat to throw out before we finish this video, this does not include every feat that a spellcaster should take. And I don't mean, you know, like you're going to get weapon finesse or, you know, point blank shot and precise shot, you know, the combat feats to help you hit with your ray spells or your melee touch attacks. I, I don't even mean that. I mean, there are feats that like, uh, the name of one escapes me, but there's like one that specifically only works if you cast the spell, Dispel Magic, or something similar, like Greater Dispel Magic. And that's a feat. It's not in this list, but clearly you'd have to be a caster to get that feat to work, right? So when I talk about other feats, you may see me refer to the fact, well, this is a spell casting feat, something that would benefit only really a spell caster, someone that has the ability to cast spells. And remember, in this game, everyone's going to be a caster, or at least every main character will be a caster. Why? Because you're going to get a mythic path, right? Every mythic path gets an access to a spell book. You may not be great at it, but you will have spells. Whether you choose to use them or not, that's on you, man. But know that you will be a caster. I kind of dig this game for this reason alone. Because those people that are like, I, I don't like playing wizards or sorcerers or whatever. I just, I'm a fighter. You know, I just like to you know, beat things with a big stick. I'm good at it. I got armor. got my shield. I'm all good. It kind of makes them play a, a, a hybrid. And they may not want to. They may never touch it. But by and large, I, I think it will change a lot of people's opinions on casters. Let's just say it that way. With that, though, my name is Brother Mutant. Please like, subscribe, comment down below. Did I say something wrong? I'm sure I did. Feel free to bitch about it down below. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. I, again, I would rather you say the correct way below to correct my mistake so that people learn correctly. That's what we're here for. We're all trying to expand our knowledge on this game. With that, though, I'll see you guys soon. Bye now.